car. Hundreds of people doing some trade offs. He did have a long drive from Brownsboro, so we'll just give him a couple of minutes. One thing for us, though, we could take care of a couple of miscellaneous things. The executive director of the report and the approval of the amendment itself. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had a few announcements. Uh, first, the hospital budget orders are posted on our website and have been sent to the hospitals. Uh, there was a review October 1st, which was yesterday. And just to um, make sure that we are kept on our toes and our regular tr pr regulatory processes continue, continue, we got the ACO budget yesterday. So um, that is also posted on our website. I want to announce that we have an open public uh, comment period for the ACO budget. It started yesterday, and it will continue until November 11th. And that information is on our website. If you have any questions, please reach out to us. Um, the last item that I wanted to announce is that uh, the board has posted uh, some salary data for the hospitals. It, uh, here's Steve. <laughs> Um, it is located under our reports uh, section. And the data from, uh, on this report is taken from the 990s. And uh, the, that year that we looked at was fiscal year 2018. And uh, anything over $500,000, including, um, so salary and benefits is listed on that report. In addition, uh, we reached out, the board reached out to the University of Vermont Health Network to um, have some uh, additional data provided on their salaries. And there's a chart in on our website, and I'll explain to you just uh, a few items that the information showed. So mm -hmm. we asked um, from UVMH and to um, provide their executive compensation, compensation. And they had had a, uh, an executive or an external compensation consultant, which compared their compensation to 30 other similar sized institutions. And they found a few things. First, that executive total direct compensation as a percent of net revenue was 0.88%. And this is at the 35th percentile in hospital comparison group. Second, that executive total direct compensation as a percent of total operating expense is 0.90%. And this is at the 28th percentile in, hospital, in the hospital comparison group. And last, that the executive to total direct compensation as a percent of total payroll expense is 1.46%. And this is at the 14th percentile in hospital in the hospital comparison group. So there, all of this information is located on that same um, tab in our report section. If you have any questions, please reach out to me, and we can follow up. And that is all I have to report. Thank you, Susan. Before, before we move on, I just wanted to ask about the ACO public comment period. Sure. The 11th is a very important state holiday. Yes, it is. In addition to being Veterans Day, it's my birthday. So, <laughs> but the state offices are closed, I think. So would we make the public comment period the next day? That is a very, is it closed for your birthday? or the Well, it's holiday? closed for my birthday, for <laughs> sure. But yes, we can, we can amend that to November 12th. Okay. Thank you. So, yes, thank you. Make sure we could accept it. <laughs> yes, we will do that. Thank you very much. Okay, the next item are the minutes of Wednesday, September 25th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved to approve the minutes of Wednesday, September 25th. Without any additions, deletions, or corrections, is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Super. I'll abstain. Oh. Just for the record. Since I live not here. Thank you, Rob. So now we're going to move right into uh, the afternoon's business, and this is the uh, third discussion we've had in the last couple of years here at the board on uh, workforce. Of course, the discussions happen wherever we go, and uh, we just got through the hospital budget season, and it was pretty clear that um, there continues to be uh, a real need 
to address the workforce shortages that we're seeing in healthcare in Vermont. And it's, unfortunately, it's not just nurses, and it's not just docs, but it's across the whole spectrum, including techs and everybody else. And to, this afternoon, we've assembled eight really phenomenal people to discuss this topic. And the main thing is just to keep the discussion going. And really, we could have a couple days worth of discussion and um, probably still not address everything that's happened. I see Deb is in the audience. I think that the set the uh, one day um, dedicated specially to workforce that she held at Castleton College a year ago um, was very, very helpful. And it helped us to really learn um, so many of the barriers that uh, people see to trying to overcome the problem that we have in the state of Vermont. And we heard um, everything from, uh, when it comes to nurses, for example, um, classes not being offered at times where uh, a working parent could actually take the classes. Um, we heard from educators that uh, precepting was a problem. And that's why we're happy that Gabe's here today, because um, what we learned is that even though um, organizations like visiting nurse organizations around the state uh, were open to taking students, they, they didn't really qualify because you have to have a master's level nurse that is overseeing the students. And so uh, each of the programs that was at that discussion in Castleton talked about the ability to add additional students if they only had that precepting in place out, out in the real world. And so we see that as a barrier. Um, you know, there's been some excellent work done by uh, the Business Roundtable through the Talent Pipeline. Uh, Marianne Shahan really went out and uh, surveyed um, organizations to try to determine what the actual shortage is in the short term over the next couple of years for nurses. They came back at 3,900 in the next two years. Um, and that's not surveying all the, the small nursing homes in the state. So we know it's a, a greater problem than even 3,900. Trey's on the panel, and we hear repeatedly from Tom D um, at hospital presentations and others the average age of the uh, physician workforce there. And you know what's going to happen in five years when everybody's at retirement age. So, you know, these are the, the issues that uh, we've been dealing with, and so we thought it was uh, really important to keep this discussion going and really try to get some key players to learn about some of the things that are already happening in the field and just discuss what might be able to happen to try to help Vermont as we deal with this workforce shortage. And I know that it doesn't matter what industry you talk to in Vermont, they talk about a workforce shortage and whether it's manufacturing, construction, you name it. Um, I would just say that uh, it's not selfish. I'm saying that healthcare um, should be at the, as one of the main priorities, and that's because we're gonna pay for it in one of two ways. Either we're not gonna, we as Vermonters, when I say we, I'm talking about the collective we, we aren't going to have access <coughs> to the right care. We're gonna have to wait for that care and we're going to pay for the care because as Steve I'm sure will tell us, hospitals can't turn somebody away. They have to serve that individual that walks in the door and to do that, they're forced to hire travelers and locums and that's, that cost is two to 300% of what it would cost to have an actual Vermonter in, in that position. And it's not just a cost factor because we often hear that if you have a traveling nurse, they're not as familiar with the equipment in that hospital. And at a time when we're trying to move away from um, fee-for-service to value-based medicine, we want a better coordination of care. And travelers and locums may not know all the different uh, players in the community so that the individual doesn't end up being readmitted to that high-cost hospital setting. So these are the, the issues that we're dealing with. And we're just really happy that um, we've been able to put together this outstanding panel 
Um, starting on the far side of the room from me, we have Steve Gordon, uh, the president and CEO of Brattleboro Memorial Hospital. We have Jeff Spaulding, the chancellor of the Vermont State Colleges System. We have Gabe Gilman, who's the general counsel for the Office of Professional Regulation at the Vermont Secretary of State. We have Dina Orfanidis, Vice President, Chief Nursing Officer at Northwestern Medical Center. We have Dr. Trey Dodson, Chief Medical Officer at South, uh, East, Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. We have Joyce Judy, the President of the Community College of Vermont. We have Anna Noonan, President of Central Vermont Medical Center. And we have Melissa Davidson, who's a doc and an anesthesiology um, professor at the University of Vermont Health Network Medical Group. So this is an outstanding panel. And um, what, the way we thought we would open this off is just to throw out a couple of questions and allow each of the presenters to really introduce themselves, talk about something that uh, they may be working on in their respective uh, entities, and uh, basically just start the conversation from there. So um, the questions that uh, that I throw out to you initially and hope that we get some feedback on uh, for the healthcare providers, um, how have you addressed the issues at your hospital? And for the educators, what innovations have you proposed to improve educational opportunities? So Steve, I'm gonna pick on you and start at that side of the table, if that's okay. Last one here, first one up. <laughs> My pleasure. Can everyone hear me? Um, we did um, put together a one-pager. Abigail told me one page. They did a one-pager of all the things that Brattleboro uh, is engaged in uh, to deal with uh, workforce issues across the spectrum of, of staff members. So folks have that as they came in, because uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through each of the programs that we've done. But let me tell you, several years ago, um, we were having a, a major problem um, recruiting and finding uh, medical assistance uh, for the physician practices at Brattleboro. Um, and um, we ended up, I, I actually had a meeting with uh, Joyce Judy, and I said, can we work together in developing a program? We will guarantee eight slots, eight scholarships, guarantee the positions afterwards. And um, she's a visionary, and she said, absolutely. And that program is now, I think it is fourth year, right? Um, and looking to expand those to other um, job classifications. Um, what I think um, is critical is um, a leader like um, uh, Joyce to understand the, the challenges we have in the workforce from a healthcare standpoint and develop a program uh, working with the hospital um, and um, meeting our, our needs related to um, uh, workforce. Um, that was very unique and um, I was excited to sit next to Jeff because I think we've got to have a better, closer relationship between the hospitals in particular um, uh, and, and the universities uh, in Vermont um, to produce and help us um, uh, address those workforce challenges. And uh, we've put together a number of different programs here, both to the RNs, to the LPNs. Um, we have a nurse residency program um, that we just piloted. Um, and uh, we also have worked with uh, Department of Labor for training environmental services staff. We have a major problem recruiting and retaining environmental services staff. You can't clean your office, you can't clean your hospital, you can't serve patients. So even at that level, we've got we've to have a better pipeline. And the only way we can get to that better pipeline is, I think, working with VTC, CCD, and the colleges um, in Vermont. Despite all of doing all that we've done, um, we, we in Brattleboro um, are different than other parts of Vermont, and you're gonna get that from probably every hospital, but our competition is not Vermont hospitals. It's actually Massachusetts. Um, we're right off of 91, and 91 is a straight corridor, commuter corridor, down to Greenfield, and down to Springfield, where Bay State is located with hospitals. So um, just this uh, past year, uh, or the, uh, sorry, the past month, we have raised our minimums uh, for our rents to $30 an hour, which when I mentioned that at a, a, a recent hospital board meeting, there were a lot of gas, but our market demands that. 
we can't get to that level of compensation, it doesn't matter if we how we can sell a Vermont mystique, if you will, or come to Vermont. We've got to be in the game with our, our competition for um, scarce resources from Massachusetts hospitals. And we took a big leap, um, but we felt that's what is definitely needed. And we're probably going to have to go back to Kevin and the Vermont Care Board to get some special dispensation on grading. Not yet, Kevin. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, you've got to How did involved. I know that we would get asked for something stupid? <laughs> <laughs> well, you asked me to serve on the bill, so I could ask for this. But I think that, that is a huge step for us. Um, really looking at where we're drawing our nurses from, our professionals from, whether it's nurses, LPNs, um, whether it's physicians, primary care physicians. Um, we're in a highly competitive market, not just with Massachusetts, but across the river. Um, in New Hampshire. So we've got to uh, really, we've looked really hard at our compensation packages and benefit packages, and that's pretty straight on our organization. But um, we had to do that to complement all the other things uh, we're doing that we listed on the, uh, um, on the uh, exhibit that we provided. Hey, Jeff. Well, great. Thanks very much for being here. And uh, I'm probably the least expert pe person on the panel. But I would say the Vermont State College system uh, as a whole has a mission statement that starts with for the benefit of Vermont, not for the benefit of the institution or anything else like that. So we try to work together, uh, whether it's uh, Joyce here with Community College of Vermont or Castleton University or Northern Vermont University or Vermont Technical College to actually meet the needs of Vermont. And healthcare is actually one of our largest enrolled areas in the, in the various programs. Uh, we have over 2,000 students uh, in programs from nursing to allied health to uh, uh, you know, coding and, and broader range of, uh, of services like respiratory therapy, radiological sciences is a new program at Vermont Tech, it filled up. Uh, health and exercise science programs, dental hygiene, psychology, turn out a tremendous uh, number of, of, of counselors and social workers. And uh, last year we graduated close to 700 students in those programs. And you know, we have had and continue to develop new direct partnerships with hospitals and longer term facilities. Steve mentioned a, a great example that uh, he worked with with Joyce. Um, you know, we have, uh, and I, I'm glad that uh, Southwest Medical Center is here. Uh, when Southern Vermont College uh, was unfortunately required to close, not required, had to close its doors, uh, Castleton University stepped in and is, is glad to work with some Southwest Medical Center to uh, pick up those programs. And I think what's interesting, I'll come back to that again, is that, you know, it's not just Castleton, it is a partnership. And there's a cost, there's a higher cost in tuition and so forth to, for some of these health-related programs. And having the institutions help their new and current employees to access these programs really makes a big difference. Affordability is, is, a, is a major issue and we appreciate that. Uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, Anna's here at the table and we've, we've got a, a new partnership uh, with Vermont Technical College where we're delivering, uh, I think it's an LPN program, but I can't remember which it is, at, right at, up at Central Vermont Medical Center. We're doing the curriculum, they're providing instructors and so forth. So, uh, you know, I, I could go on for a while, I mean, we have actually a, a new good one up in Vienna and uh, in uh, St. Albans with the, the Northwest Medical Center where CCV's had a, a, a good relationship. Uh, they're building a, a new office in downtown and the hospital is helping uh, Vermont Technical Co College with some uh, new sim lab and skills lab. Uh, so I just point out that, you know, we have those partnerships, we're looking for more. Uh, you know, and I'll get back to where we can, I think, use Green Mountain Care help in a minute. Um, as I just mentioned, you know, the program delivery costs, particularly for nursing, are high, and we already have been forced to set higher tuition rates for both Castleton and Vermont Technical College compared to their regular programs or their other programs. And just simply saying to the extent the institutions out there can help uh, their future and current employees with those tuition costs will really I think make it more possible for people to, to enter the, the workforce. You know, there's some here and now stuff, and I'm glad Gabe's here. Um, you know, there's been pointed out some need for hopefully some flexibility, flexibility with clinical instructors. 
Uh, I'm not an expert in these, but these are actually people that are actually hired uh, by uh, the, uh, the institutions that are doing the nursing, not the hospitals themselves. They're preceptors and instructors, and you know, when we hire them, uh, under the current uh, requirements, many if not all of them, uh, the clinical instructors need to have a master's degree. Uh, and that uh, compounds the ability of us to be able to afford to pay these folks, because they make more uh, in, 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 the, in their field of actual nursing, like, you know, as opposed to uh, the clinical instructors, and most of them are, are these folks are, are, are part-time. So if there is a way uh, that OPR can work with the Board of Nursing to, you know, make sure that if there are experienced uh, BSNs in there that they, they can serve as a clinical instructor, that would remove one of the sort of here and now practical barriers that, that our nursing people tell me we, we currently have. Um, you know, within our own, own system, and the confines of collective bargaining agreements, which we have, you know, in the state college system, we actually have people would be surprised, six collective bargaining agreements. Uh, and, uh, you know, we basically have been in a process where basically everybody gets paid the same faculty. Uh, and in our new contract that uh, we hope to have a signed, sealed, and delivered before the end of October, uh, we negotiated a differential pay increase specifically for our nursing faculty. And, uh, you know, it still probably won't be as, as, as much as they might earn elsewhere, but it's an attempt to try to help us be able to get more uh, of our, our faculty members that, that want to help us provide programs on campus and in the, in the field. So, you know, affordability is, is, is a barrier, you know that. Um, I want to just mention what I consider to be the big one for us. And, you know, given the pressures our system already has, and I don't need to use this as a stump speech on that, it's a challenge for us to cover the upfront cost to big, bring programs onto line. Um, you know, like some of you will know, just as a, as a sideline one, the legislature, Kevin, probably back you know, many years ago, passed a, a legislation that set up a dental therapy program. And Vermont Tech has been trying to get that off the ground for several years with no money. In you know, those programs, you have to have a program director, you gotta go through you know, accreditation, you gotta recruit students and do all that before, you know, develop the curriculum, all that, before anybody ever comes. And they don't have the money to do it. So I'm just pointing that as an example. Castleton is looking at a couple of new programs and- Jeff, can I interrupt there? Just sure. to ask a, a question of you. And when you're starting a new program like that, and of course, you know that there will be an ask at some point from us, and you know that I communicated this to you already. I really believe that Vermont needs to have a physician's assistance program. When you start a new program like the dental therapist, or if you were to consider a physician's assistance program, is that outside of the contract? And can you start with differentials? Or does the contract require you to pay the same to somebody that would be teaching a primary care provider as something else? It's pretty much within the confines of the contract. Now, there's some, some positions, administrative, higher level management positions that are not covered by contract. So, you know, but, but, but when you start getting into faculty and things like that, you're, you're pretty much in there. But it's just, a, it's, it just is, it, and it's not that much money either, but it costs money. I mean, you know, I'm told right now that there's a high need for, for a different program, masters in social work, which work in all kinds of facilities out there. There isn't a program in the state. But the requirements to get that up and going are fairly significant. Uh, you know, uh, there, Castleton right now is, 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 is in the process of early stages of standing up a, it's not a physical therapist, but it's a, it's, there are two of them, one's an o physical therapy assistant and an OTA occupational therapy assistant. They're doing it because they, it's been an identified need in the Rutland region, uh, but you know, they gotta get a program director, stand it up and it, 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 they, it's gonna take them a long time to do it. So my main point, if I could, is that where we could use help from the Green Mountain Care Board uh, and industry leaders, the talent pipeline, is helping us identify the future, future high demand where workforce is likely to be scarce areas like three to five years down the road. Not so much today and yesterday and tomorrow because you know it takes us a while. If we could just sort of be clear, this is what is coming, and if there's a way to provide some additional help once we agree, look, you're the right people to do it. Obviously, we're, we're not gonna be providing you know, pediatricians and, and things that the, that the University of Vermont does. The ones that we can do, 
uh, if we get agreement on what they are, if there's some way to provide through this industry-wide area, some, uh, some startup funds that we all agree makes sense with a plan that, that makes sense to people, uh, we could really appreciate that. Thank you. Fair enough. <laughs> Gabe. Thank you. Um, and thank you for having me. It's just a privilege to be here with people who are thinking about the interplay between these systems. Um, I toil away in a fairly obscure agency, and we, we think we've learned a lot, and we think we have a lot to learn. Um, and forums like this are incredibly important to doing that. Um, so OPR is uh, Vermont's umbrella professional credentialing and licensing agency. Uh, we have responsibility for the licensure and credentialing and practice rules pertaining to almost every health science provider uh, in the state who is not a medical doctor or a physician assistant, a podiatrist or an anesthesia assistant. On nearly every other category of health science provider, um, from acupuncturists to actual technicians, um, is licensed out of the Office of Professional Regulation. Um, OPR is not a uh, passive home to our regulatory boards. Uh, more than three quarters of our programs are not board governed. They're governed directly by the Director of Professional Regulation and appointee of the Secretary of State. Um, we quite like that model because it's very nimble. We don't have to wait for a call to get together every month in order to move important items. Um, and it's no less transparent, it may be more so. Um, we are also home, though, to our established uh, health science boards, the Board of Dentistry, the Board of Osteopathic Physicians and Surgeons, uh, Psychologists, and many others. Um, so our functions uh, involve dictating who is credentialed and eligible to work lawfully in regulated fields, um, as well as setting standards in those fields. Um, and, and we do that not based on our own intuition, but based on some really excellent legislative guidance that exists in Chapter 57 of Title 26, a chapter I'm confident that no one in this room has read. Maybe I can, maybe I can provoke you to do that, but it's a brilliant piece of legislation that came out of the late 70s and laid out for the state of Vermont to all of our benefit a really clear legislatively endorsed statutory policy on what is occupational and professional licensing for. And the reason that was done is that gratuitous occupational and professional licensing can be enormously damaging uh, to labor market fluidity, to the ability of people to do what they want with the talents that they have, and for the ability of people such as our hospitals who want to hire talented people to do that. Um, it is a tool that is uh, used uh, when appropriate, but uh, it has significant downsides. And one of our jobs as an umbrella agency is to remind people of those downsides, to police um, the, the kind of escalator of regulatory requirements that will come out of just putting a group of professionals in a room and saying, you know, you're here, it's the second Tuesday of the month, what new rules can you imagine? And um, we did that for decades throughout the United States. And it was really only around 2015 that the dam broke for complex reasons I won't get into. Um, and, and through the leadership of the Secretary of State, Deputy Secretary and Director in Vermont, um, we've really tried to harness ourselves to an important national movement that, uh, which is also bipartisan in nature, a very interesting coalition of folks who are on the left and concerned about social mobility and opportunity, on the right who are concerned about economic opportunity and restricting the size and, and scope of government. And wherever you come from on that spectrum, you come to the same conclusion, which is that what we have been doing in licensing uh, since the Second World War is not working for the modern economy. Um, to that end, we have specific programs going on aimed at implementing the policies in Chapter 57 and adjusting them to the circumstance we find ourselves in. Um, these are varied. I have 10 reports this summer. I printed my little list. I called them my summer reports. And every time I do that now, people remind me it's not the summer and I'm panicking. Um, <laughs> But those uh, relate to, could not relate more directly to what we're here talking about. One of the reports is a supplement to a report on the costs and benefits of entering the nurse licensure compact. Uh, this is an interstate agreement entered into by various legislatures that would allow uh, someone holding a compact license to walk into 30 plus member states. Uh, among them, our neighbors, Maine and New Hampshire. Um, so, and very significant consequences for the ability of hospitals to hire credential people. Um, also, countervailing consequences, um, the chairman is talking about travelers. Um, that, in a sense, one, one will see more travelers, or at least an incentive um, to pull in more travelers. So there's no pure thing in this area. Um, but in general, um, as a principle, 
uh, permitting a fluid labor market where talented people can go where they want, when they want, and be hired by who wants to hire them, um, results in better marketplace matching, more efficiency, and happier people. Um, so the nursing compact study has uh, resulted in uh, feedback from the nursing community and the general health science community that is highly favorable to enter in that compact, and I think we may see some movement on that front uh, very soon. Um, we've also been asked to do other things, like evaluate where there are apprenticeship pathways to licensure. Um, I think one of the elephants in this room, if not the elephant, is student loan debt. Um, it is a significant factor in the behavior of the people we are trying to recruit into the health science workforce. We'll get to later, if we have time, the role that plays in our difficulty uh, getting nurse educators interested in obtaining master's degrees. Um, but uh, to that end, the legislature has asked us to look at um, apprenticeship pathways to licensure that may be less expensive. In two columns that I won't get into for lack of time, we have seen the nimbleness of CCC and the community college system and their responsiveness and their willingness to monitor the marketplace and the new demands for um, mid-level credentialing and to respond to it with existing programs that are accessible to Vermonters where they are. Um, that's an incredibly important realization. It has a lot of promise in terms of credentialing up and training people appropriately, not giving them pointless training they don't need, which is a hallmark of our existing system in some places. Um, and so CCV has a very important role here and already has been a critical partner to OPR in some of its efforts. Um, we have a study of pharmacist scope of practice. Uh, the legislature is quite aware that uh, it is in everyone's interest to allow people who have uh, very expensive and technical graduate training to use that training in the marketplace to the best of their ability. Um, and I think pharmacists are among the health science professionals who may be most um, underused, their talent misallocated. Um, so we are looking at um, the role of pharmacy technicians in the, uh, in the dispensing process, uh, whether liberalizing that role under supervision of a pharmacist may uh, lead to efficiencies. And we're also looking at whether pharmacists should be able to explore broader clinical avenues up to and including independent prescribing. Um, I look for that to be controversial, but it's a very important conversation to have. Um, we're looking at a sim similar way at the scope of practice of optometrists to ask whether optometrists uh, should be able to uh, perform certain tasks um, and, to, and thereby to free um, ophthalmologists and others with more technical equipment to do other tasks. Um, and then finally, the one that everybody uh, has talked about so far, nurse educator workforce development and uh, the, the requirements pertaining to who may teach our aspiring nurses. Um, I can get into that in greater detail, and we, I will have to get into that um, because we have a report to write on that subject. Um, a very interesting topic. We, in the area of nurse education, we historically have found ourselves in a funny place because the nurses, the RNs at the inception of the profession and continuing for decades after, uh, we're trained by hospitals, and so state boards of nursing were charged with regulating the manner in which those professionals are trained. Um, now they're trained in colleges and universities, and they're college and university accreditors as well, and the two have kind of moved in parallel, neither giving any ground and sometimes uh, repeating the fun sometimes one repeating the functions of another. Um, and so part of that report um, necessarily will involve asking whether, whether the Board of Nursing has an appropriate role in a task that uh, third-party accreditors are performing. Um, so there's a lot to a lot to be done there. Um, I should point out that the existing requirement for nurse educators um, is that they be enrolled in, matriculated in, even one credit of a, of a master's program. They didn't actually hold that degree. But that, again, gets to what I was talking about, which is the simple behavioral deterrent. The idea of taking somebody who's just getting ahead on his student loans and saying, how do you feel about a master's degree? Not good, is how he feels. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a tough hurdle to overcome. Um, and so we've got a lot of exciting developments, um, important developments, exciting developments, and we're really trying to engage our boards in thinking not just about what should the rules be, how do we build the optimal professional, but how do we balance access with quality? How do we make sure we're setting a floor and not a ceiling? How do we make sure we are getting credentials in the hands of qualified people as soon as we reasonably can without undue red tape and letting the marketplace do the rest? Um, so that's what we're up to, and I am probably over time. <laughs> it's okay. It's fascinating information. So thank you, Kate. Dina. 
Yes, um, thank you for um, allowing me to participate in this really important discussion. Um, some of the statistics I'd just like to share just to kind of frame where we're going and where I think we need to go in terms of the profession of nursing and being able to support the care of our Vermonters. Um, we can appreciate that there is going to be a million nurses needed across the nation by 2024. Um, and I heard a, a statistic that here in Vermont, we're going to be required to have 3,900 qualified nurses to take care of our patients. Also, a uh, known fact is there are 56,000 qualified nursing students that are turned away and not able to be placed in uh, programs because of this faculty um, requirement. So as, the, as you can appreciate, this presents opportunity for the profession of nursing and the state of Vermont as well as the nation. So when I um, think about this, I was fortunate to come to Northwestern Medical Center with a vision that was created by some folks around this table and Jill Berry Bowen as a CEO in identifying a partnership for those um, nurses in Franklin County to be able to really reinvigorate um, that uh, academic and provide an economic drive in bringing a school of nursing um, to Franklin County at St. Albans. So I'm um, very proud to report that we'll be opening and enrolling our first class in September 2020. We'll have joint um, faculty placement NMC will sponsor and support up to 10 nursing scholarships um, for tuition reimbursement on the, um, over a period of time repayment of those loans. Um, in addition, we'll be sharing that space with Vermont Technical College um, in regards to skills lab and simulation, um, simulation lab in regards to a joint place for training both on the academic side as well as the hospital side. So it's a wonderful opportunity for um, students learning environment and how can we then um, really enculturate them into an environment where there's a mentorship and a support through lifestyle medicine, um, education and training. So really thinking a little bit differently, although uh, this practice has been uh, placed uh, along uh, other organizations or communities within the country. Um, the other things that I would like to capture is that I think it's extremely important um, in regards to what I call an Aspire Nurse Residency Program, bringing those nursing students into organizations, finding that they have the right academic preparation as well as onboarding to the profession of nursing. As we appreciate, um, healthcare for all of our disciplines is uh, quite challenging um, in relation to workplace violence. And I think that's something that we seriously um, as healthcare community need to think about um, in regards to making this an attractive um, career for for those young people um, entering the field. I know for myself, I'm 30 years, I've been a registered nurse in multiple roles and extremely proud and grateful for that opportunity. Uh, but how do we uh, engage our, our young youth in that this is a profession, healthcare that we, uh, we uh, benefit from and what it can provide for lifestyle and the commitment to our community and a public service. Um, one other additional um, piece of information that uh, most folks here around the table and I suspect you'll hear more of is really allowing for tuition reimbursement. I, I agree with that the student loan debt and the commitment that it's continuous learning. Um, when we think about outcomes related to uh, clinical nurses, uh, there is evidence that uh, obtaining a bachelor's prepared and a master's prepared, um, your quality outcomes are correlated to that. There's literature to support that. So I think it's important as a um, healthcare leaders that we encourage and we facilitate making that happen in a reasonable way. Um, I'm fortunate to work with an organiza organization at Northwestern that is very competitive in regards to that tuition reimbursement, but 
more as a community of Vermonters, how we can think about that. Um, maybe some of the same or a little bit differently, I think is uh, one of the key things in regards to um, next steps uh, in that area. Um, also, I just am grateful to hear um, that I think it's really important to consider that compact. That compact license really gives flexibility for <laughs> nurses to enter the state of Vermont and not have barriers relating to licensure. Um, New Hampshire, Maine, having that, um, yes, I, I believe you know folks would consider that it could be bi-directional, but honestly, the profession is fluid, um, the workforce is very fluid, and I appreciate uh, capturing that. It really is a satisfaction, so uh, I'd just like to close with that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dina. Trey. Well, uh, thanks, Kevin. Excited to be here. I'm excited to learn. Uh, a few things. Jeff had mentioned um, that Southwestern Vermont Medical Center has a program now with Castleton College that went live officially September 1st. It's pretty simple. It basically, it's for RN jobs. Um, there's actually a uh, location in Bennington now uh, for these students. And SVHC will provide up to 100% reimbursement, uh, assuming that they meet certain criteria of coming back to the hospital and working. And you know, we did this, as you would imagine, you, you do it from a financial business uh, planning aspect, and it was very straightforward, the, the ROI on it. I can't quote you those numbers right now, but it was not many years into the future that the return uh, will, will um, be great for the community. And we've uh, done extremely well in this first class. It's kind of funny, because most of the <laughs> students were already in our system somehow. You know, they were already familiar with SVMC. Uh, and familiar with the community. Um, so that's gonna be great, we're looking forward to that. Um, just trying to think outside the box, I think we've presented the Green Mountain Care Board, but for the past couple years we've been taking homes downtown, you know, this is nothing new, there's a lot of places that do this, but it's been really successful for some of our staff, where we take the homes, uh, we improve them, we use local, uh, local employers, most of whom are married or have relationships with somebody in the hospital to begin with, so we keep it really local. And I think we've had four homes now, we're on our fifth one. That doesn't sound like a lot, it's actually very important for four individual families and it allowed them to stay in the community. And so I'm very excited about that one. The next two are, are moving forward into the future. Uh, the first is the Putnam Block, which you may have seen, because this is a pretty big investment. It's about $60 million investment in downtown. SBMC, along with eight uh, community partners, uh, formed this coalition. There's a lot of mechanics there. Talk about it, not simple type arrangement. I couldn't be able to uh, re-explain it, but we're um, starting on phase one now. Uh, that'll be complete within a year. Phase two will start. This is a total revitalization of the downtown. And one main aspect, besides uh, trying to get people to come visit, is actually to get people to come live there. So in the first phase, I believe there's like 30 apartments, and then after that there's another 60. These are nice places that families can live in and live downtown. Um, so that should be very uh, productive for developing our workforce. And then a, a much bigger one that's early, uh, but I hope in five years we'll be really moving forward, and that is we are developing a family medicine residency program in uh, Bennington at SDMC. We're partnering with Dartmouth Hitchcock. It's a little complicated because Dartmouth can't do a family medicine residency, um, but they can certainly partner with us. Uh, we haven't gotten through all the hurdles, but we have done all the background um, items that, that make us believe we can do it both financially as well as regulatory. So that's likely in a 2022, 2023 uh, will be the first class and it will be four residents per year. That's 12 new people uh, over a three year period, new family medicine positions that hopefully will stay in Vermont. And it, it's shown that about 65% in primary care uh, physicians will stay in the state that they trained in. So whether that translates exactly um, just even a few, I'll be very happy. I know uh, Kat back there, Dr. McGraw, would be very happy if we can keep some of these uh, physicians here. And then we're also doing a lot with telemedicine as are many hospitals. I look at it a little differently than what you may be thinking. You may be thinking about that's access for community uh, members to not have to travel to see specialists. Absolutely, that's the whole point. But there's other main points. We can't keep a solid ICU nurse uh, in our um, in our ICU, especially one that hasn't had that much experience when they're getting offers to go elsewhere and gain a lot more experience.
Here, we can keep patients now, because we have our ICU going with, with critical care physicians and critical care nurses. And that's actually attracted new hires for us, both as hospitalists and as well as critical care nurses, because they see, oh, I, I can stay in a rural community, get all the benefits of being in Vermont, and yet uh, practice at a high level and continue my education. That's pretty exciting. As far as things that, that I'd like to somehow talk about, um, the way that we can all work together, this is a little anecdotal, but having now recruited for many years, where I see the most success is when I'm able to recruit people that want to be here, not for all of the financial reasons. Now, they have huge debt, so that's something to focus on. But if I can find and target, which I can't, if I can have help, if we can all work for targeting people that want to be here, it's much more successful. And I would say probably of our last 10 to 15 positions, um, at least two thirds of them, when they looked for us, because they looked towards Vermont and the type of lifestyle they were, they were envisioning would be here. And it's hard to piece that out when you go out and just recruit in your normal fashion. And you certainly don't do well when you pretend to be a place that, that you're not. So I know that. Thank you, Trey. Joyce? Great. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about TCB, and thank you for the previous references. You have to remember that visionary quote. There you go. I know. I know. Thank you. Um, just, a, just a quick um, sort of thumbnail sketch of the Community College of Vermont. Um, we think of Vermont as our campus. We have 12 locations um, strategically placed around the state of Vermont. And um, we serve about 5,000 students who walk through our door and enroll in our programs. In addition to our on-ground program, we have a very significant online program, actually, of the 800 courses we're offering right now, almost 40% of them are online. And that's being driven totally by, by our students, the student needs. Um, and, you know, people come to CCD for really for two reasons. One is that if they're young and they are thinking, or, or they're adults and they want to um, start at CCD and they have aspirations to transfer transfer within the Vermont State Colleges, transfer to the University of Vermont, transfer wherever, they can start with us and do that. The second is, and probably the most important, is they come for jobs. It's something related to jobs. Either they have a job and they want something better, they're stuck where they are, or they're entering the job market for the first time. Um, they're veterans who are transitioning back from military service. They've been in the construction business and they're hurt and they have to transition into another career. So we just see a lot of, uh, a variety of, of folks who come to CTV. And I oftentimes describe us as we're the open end of the funnel. We are, the, we are a place where people can start. And most students who come to us aspire to something beyond CTV. So we are the group that sort of, we, we work with younger students and we help them and we build pipelines to other programs. I'll give you an example. Set, more than 70% every year of the students graduate in nursing from Vermont have to start at CCD. That's a significant pipeline in terms of that. CCD has the largest number of students, <coughs> co largest transfer cohort transferring to the University of Vermont. And I will also add that this is a particular part of this and their most successful cohort. So many students start with us um, and aspire to go other, other places. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about student loan debt, and it is a huge issue. And it's, and quite frankly, it's one of the reasons why Vermont has one of the highest high school graduation rates and one of the lowest college loan rates. And it's because people here on the street, that it is, that they're going to come out of college with so much debt. But there are ways to put together their education that are much less expensive. I'll give you an example. Students can start at CCD and transfer after two years if they went to school full time. You should start even earlier though, because you work so hard on That's early right, college. early college. Well, that is, no, you're absolutely right. Um, but just, you, if you, if a student started at CCD, earned their first two years, they can, we have guaranteed admissions programs with many programs at UVM. They'll save $10,000 on their freshman year, $10,000 on their sophomore year. And so that's what $20,000 on the front end of a college education is real money. And so, and you know, you can do that with the Vermont State Colleges, you can do that with, with the privates. So there are ways to put this together. And as um, 
Um, Kevin was saying, one of the things that Vermont has been very forward thinking with the legislature is dual enrollment where students who are in high school can take, they're eligible to take two college courses. They also, if a student wants to do their whole senior year, they can, um, at a college, they can do it at CCD or other participating colleges. Um, there are many other Vermont State colleges that use it. So I actually had just recently had a single mom say to me, you know, I have two children. I wanted my kids to go to school. I never thought we could afford it. But because I had a daughter who took two dual enrollment courses as a, as a junior, she did early college as a senior. She entered Castleton University as a, as a second semester sophomore and started at ground zero in terms of the cost. So there are ways to really think about this. And, you know, we have students who go on the nursing program. You know, we had just found out we had a student who had just completed her dental program, and she's a full-fledged dentist. So people, you know, oftentimes people think community colleges naturally struggle with the stigma. But there are, are ways to really um, build your future um, by starting there. But, you know, one of the things I really wanted to, um, to talk a, a little bit about is Yes, we serve the students who walk through our door, but one of the most important um, pieces of our work is our work with businesses. And um, Steve has alluded to that. We're doing some really interesting work with um, Central Mount Hospital. It's really about how do we work with businesses and help you grow your own. Because 95% of the students who come to CCD are Vermonters. They're staying here. They're here, and how do we help them become the workforce of the future? And so, but as we think about adults, whether they're 18 or 80, the two most important barriers are time and money. And so if, they, if, if there's ways to think about helping people move forward in their education and address the two components of time and money, it is a win for adults. And so I use, are you going to talk about this? Oh, OK, then I will leave that to Anna. <laughs> but I think what's really important, and Steve has alluded to this with his program, is how do you, uh, most adults, and again, when I talk about adults, I'm talking about 17, 18 year olds or 60 year olds. They have to, they cannot give up their, their livelihood. They cannot stop work and continue their education. So how do you help them learn and earn at the same time? And so I think there's, there's some really innovative things that are going on. We have really dipped our toe pretty heavily into the apprenticeship um, area. And it's a great way for adults to earn and learn. Um, uh, one quick example, we were approached by CVS um, a year ago. They are desperate for pharmacy tech, um, technicians. And so we have worked with them to develop a pharmacy tech apprenticeship program. And so we just got enrolled our first class. We had um, 14 students. That was all we could handle um, this fall. And we have several pharmacies, CVS, Shaw's, um, a number of them uh, throughout the state who are sponsoring pharmacy techs. So they are working and they're taking courses at the same time. And so in the end, they will be eligible for much more pay. And um, they'll be able to, there will be such an asset to the local pharmacy. So I think what I, what I see is I think there's tremendous potential, but we do struggle with um, time and, and money um, in Vermont. And um, I'll just finish with, you know, we, have, we do have a problem in Vermont. We have the highest high school graduation rate, one of the highest in the country, and we have one of the lowest college going rates. And it's not, and for me, it's not about college. It's about the willingness to continue your education, whether it's a certificate, whether it's going into the military, whatever. And so somehow we have to flip the narrative that it is really um, important to continue education. Because every year we're graduating between six and 7,000 high school seniors, and only about half of them are continuing any form of education in two years. So that's a significant number of people that are just out on the streets earning entry level, and I'm mm -hmm. really struggling. And it would be a benefit to us and to Vermont and to Vermont <coughs> businesses if we could really sort of work with that group and build that pipeline. So Joyce, so, before we go I'll on to Anna. Anna. <laughs> so far. Before, before we go on to Anna, yeah. of the, you said roughly half of the 6,000 went yeah. out of college, how many finish? How many have, 
how many um, of the students who continue their yeah, so you're, you're down to 3,000. Yep. How, how, how many actually finished? finish college? Well, so here, this is a really good question, um, Kevin, because, you know, I would say that a lot of this is old metrics. Now, community colleges don't have, our graduation rate is 15 to 20 percent, but let me tell you how graduation rates are figured. You know, every industry has its own, like, challenges. So, the way graduation rates are figured in this country are on a first-time, full-time cohort. So if you're a first-time college-born student and you're enrolled full-time in a college, that's the cohort that, is figured, that your graduation rate is figured on. So 1,000 new students started CCD this fall, and of that, about 85 of them were first-time <laughs> So our graduation rate for three years is figured on that 85 students out of 1,000 who really did start with us. But here's two catches to it. So if they transfer to Castleton, or transfer to Vermont Tech, they're not they're they're dropped out of the cohort, so they're considered not not a graduate. They don't graduate. And if they drop below full time, they're not they're out of the they're out of the graduation. So the data is just not that good. So the data is is just really troubling. And I will also <coughs> say that I think one of the things that we have to sort of think about is how are young folks accessing education today? It's Yes, there's always going to be the top 20% who are going to enroll in the Middlebury's and Dartmouth's and Harvard's, and that's really important. But then there's the rest of the adults, or the rest of the students, who are going to take some courses, get a credential, go to work, get stuck where they want, come back, take some more courses, continue. You know, this straight line trajectory that that I will say that my generation was used to, is just not the way that a lot of our, our students are accessing education. So graduation rates for me are, are a challenge because what do we mean by that? You know, if a student takes seven years to, to get their associate degree at CCD because they stopped and started, that's a success. But they're, they're not even in the realm of counting. So. Yeah. Well, again, thank you. It's wonderful to be part of this panel. Um, we've, there's a lot of things that um, have already been touched on that we do at CDMC as well. Um, but I'm going to focus on a couple of areas that are um, new programs for us that have really made, it, I think, a difference for us. And you've already heard how the importance of those partnerships, and, and um, I can't thank the partnerships that we have enough with both CCD and the Vermont um, uh, college system that's been phenomenal. So I'm just going to step us back. We, we probably all know these stats, but um, June of 19, the latest statistics from the U.S. Bureau of Statistics is that Vermont's unemployment rate is at 2.1%. I think that's the lowest on record. Um, and we certainly feel that every day when we're recruiting um, uh, staff into our organization. <coughs> high, high level of competition for all positions. You heard about the RM position challenges. You're going to hear and have heard about the position of provider challenges. But the entry-level position challenges are also pretty intense. Um, so it's very difficult for us um, to recruit into our, our entry-level direct care providers, those being um, LNAs, licensed nurse aides, CCAs, clinical care um, um, assistants, and then uh, an area that nursing has moved away from, but we're moving back in, is the notion of the LPN, the licensed practical nurse. And we have a definite role, particularly in the skilled nursing facility arena, we have a 153-bed licensed um, nursing, skilled nursing facility. It's very, very challenging to staff um, in that uh, some of our most vulnerable populations, those being our, our elders. Um, so we've done all the traditional stuff that you probably know most healthcare organizations do. We, the job fairs, the sign-on bonuses, um, relocation fees, we cover those things. Tuition reimbursement, all of those things are just part of the portfolio now. We have to do those things. We have to stay competitive. And our market is, is really the New England market. Um, the national market is actually a lower base if you go across the nation. So we are recruiting, as, as um, my other colleagues have mentioned, uh, more regionally. And those salaries are high. So we have to stay competitive if we want to bring um, those individuals into our organization in Central Vermont. Um, we did uh, increase our base salary ranges for a variety of, of um, areas and um, roles in our organization. We have this 
uh, from the process we go through when we look at one of the hot jobs, the jobs that are difficult to recruit into, that we have turnover issues, um, <coughs> and we uh, try to use our um, the dollars we have to position ourselves for those types of roles, and that's something that's been ongoing. Um, we did increase our RNA base salary. Um, you know, even the people that fill these roles will move in and out of organizations for, for a quarter. Um, and that's real, uh, that's very real. That's significant over um, a, a full-time role, that's a significant dollar amount for those individuals. So we did increase our base salary for most of our entry-level roles. We're not quite at the $15, but we're just a little south of that. Um, and the other thing we've done is just retention. How do we keep our employees um, uh, within our organization? So we're a strong believer in employee-led councils. We started a, an employee council in our nursing home setting. We have a strong shared governance model in our acute care setting. We're spreading that across organization. And we believe that when people have opportunity to engage in decision-making around their practice and their profession, they'll stay. And so that, that's proving true for us, which is, which is wonderful. And we've also established career ladders for both LNAs and our CCAs. Those are traditionally not roles that have career ladders, um, but it is part of it. Uh, you know, they're part of our uh, fabric and uh, investing in them both at the entry level and guiding them, and you'll hear how we're trying to do that at CBMC into higher level positions in healthcare is also such a trajectory for them that they may not have um, an advantage of uh, prior to some of these programs. So this year we launched um, a licensed nurse assistant um, educational program. We were grateful for a Vermont training grant that we applied for and were able to receive. Um, all of our educators, you heard us talk about the need for educators. Even in these roles, those educators are critical. So our Central Vermont Medical Center, uh, Center staff um, serve as the educators and clinical preceptors. We've also given the opportunity for seasoned, very competent LNAs that are more senior. They serve as preceptors, and that's also uh, a retention piece for them. We get a lot of gratification from teaching what they, what they know and have learned. I won't get into the curriculum, but no, it's pretty comprehensive for that level. We've run three cohorts through uh, that program since we launched that in April and 16 have completed the program to date, and that's pretty significant for us. Um, we have another cohort starting in November, um, eight more individuals that um, this is their first entree into healthcare is in this LNA program. Um, we support them by hiring them into the roles and then training them. So they get a salary while they're learning that new skill. Um, the CCA level, this was a new role for us in our organization. In our practices, which we have 27 practices across the Central Vermont area, um, there was a, a high uh, population of, of RNs and very few of these um, clinical care associate roles, which is a pretty common role to have in a practice setting. Those individuals are the ones that reach you, bring you into the room, um, they take your vital signs, they may do a lab draw, um, weights, those sorts of things, and they do a very high level um, intake, and it's really a facilitator for the provider. Um, those roles did not exist in our clinics. Um, and so we're looking at our, our cost structure. That was something that we've um, begun to uh, bring in. And the other piece of that is we really needed to shift our RNs to focus on care coordination, RN nurse uh, wellness visits, health promotion, and education. So we want our RNs focusing and uh, really providing care at the top of their license. Um, and so we're moving them in that direction and just changing the skill mix. So the things that we don't need an RN license to do, we're going to have the CCAs do. The challenge with that is no CCAs existed in our market. So it's the field degree phenomenon, right? If you build it, they will come. So we decided we needed to build that curriculum as well. And again, same thing as the RNA, our, our nurses um, provide the um, education <coughs> for them. We develop the curriculum. It's pretty intensive. They can learn to do wing acupuncture, so drawing blood, all of those things. And that's about a 100-hour um, program. And the RNA program is about Again, we've got two cohorts going through that. A total of 12 people have completed that program, and as they complete the program, we uh, place them in those practices. They do their training in those practices, and their clinical experiences there. They, as I mentioned before, have a career ladder. So if once they're a year in that CCA role, they um, move to a CCA level two, higher level of compensation, a few more skill sets that um, will come forward with them. And again, we're trying to coach them to keep advancing into the healthcare arena. 
And then the last program that I want to talk about that was really the significant partnership with um, Vermont Technical College and CCD is our LPN program. So we, um, I know and I'm a nurse, so I can say this, um, uh, nurses nationally um, at, at uh, the preparatory level were phasing out LPNs. Um, they really, we really felt as a um, profession that entry level um, for nursing should be at a baccalaureate level. And I, I'm a strong believer of that. I'm also a realist. And so there's a role for LPNs, and there's particularly a role for LPNs in um, the skilled nursing facility arena. And we simply cannot find them. Um, and so with a partnership with BTC and CCD, we've created that curriculum and that program. That launched, um, we picked that program off August 1st. Uh, we have 18 individuals going through that program. Um, they, uh, we, um, developed uh, the prerequisite course, we'll work with CCD in the way that you heard uh, Joyce mention. So they, they've done their prerequisites, there were a few that didn't meet those prerequisites. Some of them did a preliminary, um, and I forget what the label of it is, but it's just to see what the competency level, because for some people they haven't been doing any education for a number of years, this is totally new for them. So it's just a way of establishing where their competency is and they test out of that. Um, CCD provides that, that's phenomenal. And then from there, they're doing their prerequisites. But the kicker is they're doing their prerequisites at, C at UB, uh, C CDMC. They're doing them on site. Before we launched this program, we did a series of focus groups. And we asked um, folks in our organization, if we provided this, would you, would you participate? And they said, yeah. Uh, but the challenge for, for me to participate is, you've heard it already, cost. I can't afford it. I have to, I have to work. I have to pay for my rent. And my, my mortgage if they have one, um, you know, all the things that one needs to cover with, with a salary. Um, they can't afford to stop working to do any of these programs. So that support as an employer to pay for them while they're doing that <coughs> is key. The other thing we heard is even transportation was a challenge. So it's hard to travel to where um, uh, those classes may be offered. Joyce has addressed that and others have addressed that through the online curriculum. That's phenomenal. But the other barrier we found is they wanted to go to a place that's familiar. This is a big jump for them to go from um, doing what they're doing to, to think about going back to school. And going back to school at a collegiate level is, is a huge challenge. So we're offering all the classwork um, with the exception of the anatomy lab at Central Rock Medical Center. All the faculty are, are fortunate. We have a number of master's prepared and doctoral prepared nurses. They are serving as faculty for the program, which is um, we're just thrilled about. And for those nurses that are serving as faculty, that's a professional um, piece of growth for them as well. So they may, they may not have had that on their CV in the past. Now they can add that they're a faculty member um, uh, as well as have that experience formally. So that program launched. Um, most are uh, completing their prereqs. Um, and then in, um, in a year from now, they will formally start that LPN program. Again, all of that curriculum is offered on site. Uh, and they'll be mentored and, um, by our uh, master's and doctoral prepared nurses. Um, the one comment that actually Joyce mentioned is to me is we don't have the access to this data, um, that 60% of the individuals going through that LPM program, they will be the first ones in their family to have a college education. And it speaks to what Joyce was talking about. And if we can provide them the scaffolding, and they're being, they're being mentored through this program, so not only are they doing the, the academic piece, and the clinical piece, but they're also being supported as part of our team. Um, and I also want to just um, give a shout out to Green Mountain United, where we brought in Working Bridges, one of their programs into our organization, and they provide scaffolding, and I know others do this in the state as well, around financial literacy, um, they help um, our staff with their income taxes, those kind of things. And we've actually offered Working Bridges to this cohort, both at the LNA, the CCA, and this LPN uh, program to just give them the other supports that they need. Um, it's, it's hard to go from doing what you do every day um, to thinking about, I'm going to go and take classes and start learning. And you may not have ever done that, or you may be the first one in your family that is doing that at the collegiate level. And that, that's a stretch. So, Giving them that, that support and that guidance is, is also helpful. And as far as what you all can do to support us, I'm going to tell you those seed grants for us were hugely helpful. 
you heard about loan forgiveness. Um, I think that's critical. Um, the burden when people leave those programs is very, very high. And I think as employers, we have to really keep exploring those innovative partnerships with some of the folks at this table, and we're grateful for those. We're going to continue to advance those. We have to think differently about how we have people enter into healthcare. And for us, it starts with, you know, are we, are we, do you want to enter at an LNA level or a CCA level, and then from there maybe go to an LPN? That stepwise approach for some is much more achievable than thinking, I'm going to go four years to do beyond some of the other programs in the state. So I'll just pause there. Thank you, Anne. Sure. Melissa. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, as I said, my name is Melissa Davidson. I'm actually here not as an anesthesiologist today, but I'm actually here representing graduate medical education. Um, my title up at UVM Medical Center is the, the designated institutional official, the DIO, of all the residency programs for University of Vermont Medical Center, which is called the Sponsoring Institution for All the Residency Programs. And that designation is, um, uh, according to our, the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, the ACGME, which is our accrediting body. Um, all told, we have 42 residency and fellowship training programs. And um, of those, 17 are core residency programs and 25 are fellowship programs. Oh, maybe I'll just make a little disclaimer here. I do represent the University of Vermont Medical Center. But I do have just enough knowledge to be dangerous of our undergraduate programs at UVM, the Larner College of Medicine. So because some of the, the initiatives that are going on actually is in partnership with the University of Vermont Medical Center. So I, I just want to um, say that out there. Um, in terms of our 42 programs, 17 are core programs, which means that these are the programs that the, that the medical students immediately leaving medical school will go into that program, which will give them primary certification. Then there are 25 programs that are subspecialty programs. Once they finish the core program, they can do further training. So an internal medicine resident might choose to be a cardiologist and go into one of those programs. While that seems like an imbalance between our core programs and the subspecialty, you have to keep in mind that the 17 core residency programs um, account for 80% of, of, of the residents, okay? So we have 275 residents in our, in our 17 training programs and 63 fellows in our 25 subspecialty training programs. Um, of those 275 residents, uh, uh, I counted about 104 of the 275 are in primary care programs. And I call primary care programs family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, OBGYN, because I think we all can agree that those programs really provide primary care to, to our, our population in Vermont. And it also includes for dental residents, because we consider that a really important piece of primary care that sometimes people forget about oral health. If you then include surgery as taking some component of primary care, psychiatry because mental health is so important in our state, and neurology, that accounts for 163 of our 275 residents. So there's a, a large cohort of our residency programs where they're taking care of our people in, some, in primary care in some fashion. Um, in terms of how our residents do when they leave here, about 25% of our residents, our, our residents and fellows, stay in the state of Vermont, which doesn't sound like a large number, but it is a large number in terms of total numbers that really stay here. We don't have a great understanding of why they're staying here. Um, we're really trying to get that information, um, but they are staying in Vermont, and a lot of them are staying in primary care. 49% of all of our graduates are in primary care, and 65% of our graduates are in primary care, if you account for those other, other few specialties, surgery, neuro, uh, neurology, and psychiatry. Um, we would like to get better numbers about why they're staying and why they're not staying. Um, but to jump ahead a little bit, if, if we ask why are we not attracting more people into our residency programs in terms of 
Why are they not coming here? The information that we have is actually kind of interesting. The number one reason why residents or medical students are choosing not to come to a Vermont program, the number one reason is that there's no job for their spouses and partners who are professionals. So that's the number one reason. Other reasons that they're not coming here is because of lack of, of affordable child care in the state, which nobody's mentioned yet, but I think that's a, a big driver for why people want to be here and can stay here. And the third one is the lack of diversity. And so we're really trying to address the lack of diversity as well. Um, but it's, it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. In order to get people here to make our state more diverse, they have to feel comfortable being here. And so getting our medical students to want to come to Vermont when there's, no, uh, this is one I've heard recently, there's, there's not a, a good Asian market, and I mean a grocery store. And so those are very important drivers to why those students will or will not come to Vermont. So we're really trying to pay attention to that. In terms of our workforce, um, we've heard a lot about, um, about what the workforce needs are. Well, across the country, they estimate that by 2032, we're gonna be in short supply of somewhere between 47 and 122,000 physicians. And that's a wide number because we don't know what's going to happen in terms of nurse practitioners and PAs in that workforce. So it's a huge range, but, I, but, but we know that we are going to be in short supply by 2032. And that accounts for about anywhere from 21 to 55,000 primary care physicians, but it doesn't stop there. 25 to 65,000 specialists and up to 23,000 surgeons. So we are going to be in short supply and that's why we're trying to address this today. Um, Across the country, our medical schools are expanding. The bottleneck is still at the graduate medical education level. The residency programs are expanding, or, or, but, but the problem is federal funding for residency programs is stagnant at the 1996 levels, and that's the cap that was set in 1996. So we are expanding without any more federal funding, okay? So we have expanded at the University of Vermont Medical Center since 2010. Our numbers are by about 50 to 60. And just in the last um, couple of years, we've expanded by, um, by um, opening an emergency medicine program because the need is so great in our network. And I think that we have seen um, a higher quality physician in our emergency departments and the interest just in having this emergency medicine program has really helped us um, with our workforce in our, in our local emergency departments at CVPH, CVMC, UVM Medical Center. You know, those are, those are just the, the nearby network programs that we've really seen a big difference so far. Maybe you could speak more to that if you want to at some point. Um, so in terms of our, of our strategic plan and where we're going, we are hoping to expand, we're hoping to expand in those critical areas. We've expanded just in the past five years in, in primary care in internal medicine. We are hoping to expand, we've heard a big need for gerontologists, um, palliative care physicians, and I'm personally, this is, this is my dream, okay. I'm hoping, hoping to start in conversations about a preventive medicine residency because that's where we start talking about population health and public policy. So that's a, that's a dream. That's a dream I'm, I'm hoping to win Powerball so that I can start paying for some of these programs, but you need, you need to play the win and I haven't started doing that. So in terms of some of the other things that we are doing, um, in terms of expansion, we've talked about that. Um, we, in the medical school, they've started the, the uh, longitudinal integrated curriculum where we have placed four students down in, in um, New York in some of our rural tracks. I believe we're starting. We have six, seven. six at Central Vermont. Starting at Central Vermont Medical Center. And this is a very big deal because what this means is that our medical students in their third years are not moving hospital to hospital, rotation to rotation. They're staying in, in almost exclusively in, in one hospital and primary care setting where they're getting all of their training in all the specialties in one place. And we, we're hoping that that means that they're going to want to stay 
in that area. And that's especially important for training our rural physicians. So that's really important. In terms of expansion, we have expanded, in not, not University of Vermont Medical Center, but the Health Network has expanded into New York, and we have a new family medicine program in New York. And they just graduated their first cohort of physicians. Um, it started with a class of four. They're graduating three. One had to decelerate, so they graduated three physicians in family medicine, and all three have stayed in the area. That's huge. I mean, that's absolutely enormous. So that's what we're hoping to accomplish with some of these other programs. Um, some of the other um, strategic initiatives, um, if this is a University of Vermont Medical Center program. It's our nursing residency program. I don't own it, but the word on the street, and by the street I mean in the locker room, because I still change every day uh, when, I go, when I go into the operating room. The word on the street is that it's very, very successful and it's becoming extremely competitive. And so that's really important in helping our young nurses get the appropriate training that they need so that they stay here. They're not getting some training and, that, and they're not being unhappy with the training that they've gotten and leaving and going, we want them to stay here. That's really important. Um, and finally, one of, the, one of our initiatives, and this is in partnership with the University of Vermont Health Network and with the College of Medicine, is trying to think about the academic structure, like an academic office, to better coordinate our learners. We are stepping on top of each other every day because the University of Vermont Medical Center and some of our local hospitals in the network, we are about the only game in town in terms of having the appropriate preceptors and the faculty. And every day, you, you know, you wonder who these people are. We definitely need better coordination of clinical care so that when we open up a PA program, Kevin, we know where we can place them for the appropriate training so that we're not fighting for the clinical cases. So that's gonna be really important and that's really just at the ground level. Still trying to figure out what that's going to look like. The biggest challenge for, for us, again, is the funding piece of it. Um, we are looking for as on, on a national level to support the new, uh, more, more um, funding to support residency training. So there's two bills on the, on the floor right now, one in the, in the House and one in the Senate. So what can you do to help us? When those bills come around and we are looking for support, you know, get your, your Congress people and your senators to support those bills because that will help us expand our residency programs. Um, and again, you, you've heard over and over, loan repayment is huge. And our, and our medical students, the average debt for medical students, um, on average across the country is $196,000. That does not include their undergraduate, $196,000. That's a driver, unfortunately, of the specialties that they're choosing. So they may not be choosing primary care pediatrics because because the debt that they're holding, especially in two physician programs, or two physician families, the debt is double, okay? It's not unusual to have our families be indebted for over $400,000 just for their medical school debt. But if you think that's bad, our dental um, students across the country, their average debt is $267,000, okay? That's huge. So loan repayment programs, that's where we really need to start thinking outside the box and being creative about how we can help our graduates stay in the state of Vermont. Thank you, Thank you. Melissa. So I'm going to open it up to the board for questions, and I'm going to start with uh, board member Robin Lunch. And um, the legislature this past year tasked um, a group called the Rural Health Task Force, which Robin is the leader of, of delivering a report to them, and I know that one of the things that they've been working on is um, suggestions on workforce. So I'm going to turn it over to Robin. Thank you. Uh, yes, as Kevin said, uh, the Rural Health Services Task Force has uh, is taking a deep dive into workforce issues in this area, uh, and we actually have several of our members in the audience, as well as Steve, who's on the panel. Um, so. One of the areas that I'd be interested in is if you had to choose one workforce initiative that you thought that we should 
promote uh, as a rural health services task force, what would it be? So that's question one. Um, and then my other question to Gabe would be, I'd love to connect with, or we can do this offline, but I'd love to connect more about the studies that you're currently undertaking so that um, we can understand better kind of where you are and how, we have a report as well due on, in January. So the question is, if what's your number one priority for workforce initiatives that you'd like us to think about? Who would like to, st to start that one? <laughs> I think you've heard um, loan repayment is a big one. Um, I think that's the central theme. And I know we've talked a lot about that in the world um, of your task force in the presentation uh, or close to May uh, a couple weeks ago. So I, I had the money I put towards that. And we do it on a local level, yeah. at the hospital level. Agreed. And the interesting thing for the three graduates from CVPH who stayed in the area to practice mm -hmm. family medicine departments, they have a loan repayment program, mm -hmm. or they have where, where they, they, they got some loan forgiveness. And that has made a huge difference. Huge difference. Great, anyone else? If, if anything comes to mind later, let me know. Yeah, this isn't a, a one-time shot. <laughs> In the middle of the night, not sleeping, and come up with a great <laughs> idea, email somebody. Yes. I'll, I'll jump in and say, in addition to the loan forgiveness, I think that the, the seed money, some of those small grants, that just allow us to explore some of the innovative programs. Um, sometimes those are hard to launch if you have to find the dollars internally. Um, but I think that that kind of grant granting process also allows for some really rich um, and I think healthy competition around um, just thinking differently and. I know that was very helpful for us for the programs we stood up as well. On, on the loan repayment, some things that I've seen over just the past 10 years um, is first off that it has gotten to the level now where people are making their decisions. So I can't say that 10 years ago many people were making their, their full decision. It was a nice thing to have. Um, but, but now it's like sort of mandating where they go. And you don't want to bring someone who doesn't want to be there. But I feel confident once they get here, they'll do mm -hmm. it. And then second is, and I don't have the answer to this, but how can we be innovative? Because you just say, oh, okay, all right, well, we're going to give you $10,000, you know, per year, and then that gets taxed quite a bit, and it's hard to, what are, what are some innovative ways to get around that? I was just interviewing a, a surgeon, and, um, and she really wanted to be in, in our area and have some connection, and so I asked her how much debt she had, and she said 250000 and I was like, gosh, that's so much money. Um, and what's the interest rate at? She said it's about 7%. And that also blew me away because, you know, my loans 15 years ago weren't near that level, first of all. But second, interest rate wasn't even in track of that. Yeah. So I don't know what those innovative things are, but maybe there's something other than just trying to you know, pay them back. Is there some way to do something different? I also think that if there's ever a way to um, crack the job here or not, the same child care costs are enormous. Uh, people who work in child care don't get paid much. And people who are paying for child care, it's way more than they can afford. So, you know, I mean, wouldn't it be great if Vermont is, what's magical about five years old or first grade? If Vermont could figure out a way to fund child care from birth to, to you know, to grade 12, it would, it, it would then, it would reverse. Um, people would want to move to Vermont. It would solve our workforce development issues. It would just address so much. We have capacity now. We don't have, we have the infrastructure. So we have empty schools mm -hmm. in every community. Why aren't we thinking, and we only have 39,000 kids in, you know, zero to age five. Can't we figure out a way to fund that um, in a way that invites people that, oh, I want to move to Vermont because I don't have a child care cost. Um, and I have child care availability. I mean, if you can find, if you can, if you can afford it, sometimes, I was talking to someone the other day, I live in Waterbury, she's 21st on a waiting list. Her kids can be seven before <laughs> she even gets into the, get into the, the number one slot. So somehow, with all the workforce issues, you know, there's a few key issues, and child care is one of those. And I just think Vermont's small enough. We ought to be able to solve that problem, and we could, and we would be in front of everybody else in the country. Mm -hmm. 
we're not just at what Jerry said around the child care, we also need to think about most of our staffs work 12 hour shifts, and a lot of the child care facilities um, do not stay open until 7 p.m., and nor do they take in um, uh, children at 7 p.m. at night for the night shift. So I think we have to think about it 24 7, and uh, guess what? We're open weekends and holidays. And so those are the kind of very real challenges. And I think that's a game changer. I think that, that would be a marketing tool for us as a state if we could. And just to reinforce the notion of how many empty school classrooms we have. I know in my community, that's a huge issue. Um, those buildings are there, but they're mostly um, vacant. So great, great opportunity. Thank you. Hey, Tom. <coughs> well, first I want to Thank you all for for being here today. I just have this feeling of somehow you could pay for you all to go away for a weekend. Uh, in two or three days, you come back with a roadmap to uh, to uh, uh, help us uh, get get far down the road. My my first question is, um, I think for Andrea and Steve, um, I took a quick look coming over here because one of the things that bugs me in this whole thing is kind of a waste of money in in a way. I mean. It's, Kevin started out by saying, you know, we're paying a two and three hundred percent premium for uh, the staff that we have when we have to go to a traveler. So I went to the 990s, the IRS 990s, and just to get a, a, a feel for what this means, and there's a contract uh, that UVM has with a company called Cross Country Traveling Nurses, and that's a fifteen point six million dollar contract. At CBMC, there's a contract. This is in the in the uh, 2018 um, uh, fiscal year. This is staffing medical solutions, a uh, uh, little over a million bucks, and in there's <coughs> a contract, and this doesn't include the, the, the contract with Dartmouth for its physicians, but with a company called PPR Travel, 1.6 million. So it's significant. So this is a significant amount of money, and I'm just curious from the hospital side mostly, uh, Anna, Deanna, and Steve, is how you approach this as an asset to be leveraged to try to get to the other side um, uh, where you're paying kind of straight up one, one for one uh, for the, the staffing that, that, that you're looking for. You want me to start? <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's, it's probably our biggest uh, budget variance um, uh, paying for the traveling nurses, and that represents probably about a um, 11 to uh, 13 FTEs, um, which on a bigger scale isn't, isn't big compared to all the staff that we do employ, but it's, it's probably our biggest vulnerability. So that's why this year, um, as we look at our competition, especially in the Massachusetts market, um, we need to attract more nurses based upon salary. Uh, despite doing all the things we're doing locally with uh, CCD, DTC, et cetera. We needed to put those dollars instead of with a traveling nurse firm to our own staff. And that's why we did, we made that investment. And our goal in that investment is to drop um, uh, the number of travelers um, by early spring down to 50% of what we're running right now. We've got to get to six travelers. Um, and, um, it's not just nursing, we have a traveler in, uh, um, in the laboratory and uh, some of the other areas, but the biggest bogey out there is, is with the RNs, and we had to make that happen. Because none of what we're doing, the residencies, the scholarships, all of that are all great, but this was the other piece that we had to, uh, we had to recognize and we had to deal with this year. And hopefully we drop that in the next IRS filing down to half a million dollars. We'll probably never get to zero because you're always going to have some turnover. Um, but we've got to we've got to address it like every probably every other hospital in Vermont. And it is, um, uh, as I said, the, the biggest challenge we have out there right now is on the workforce piece. Um, I would also agree and add it's not only nursing that we see um, use of locum travelers across all disciplines, although nursing seems to be the highest volume, in particular related to specialty practice, your EDs, your critical care, uh, potentially your operating room. 
So you really have to, um, you know, having had my career and practiced in uh, several places, really understand your workforce and the purpose and when you need to use a traveler to care for patients. Having said that, um, some of the creative things you need to consider is how to incentivize your own uh, employees and clinical teams on uh, maybe additional uh, shifts, uh, but always balancing that safety issue. As uh, also your per diem staff, but you really do need to think creatively. It's not one and done. Um, but you know, this is real and we see this, it, you know, I've always said pick a hospital across the country. This is real. And also my experience um, is that the generation, they truly nurses will come get that experience and a wonderful nurse residency, preceptorship, enjoy uh, the opportunity with the intention they're gonna travel. And um, any organization outside after you've done that hard work will pick up a, um, pick up a nurse and even pay, you know, if you have agreements related to contracting, hey, you know, we will put you through this residency, but with a two-year commitment, another HR department will pick up that cost to get that nurse already trained. So it's tricky. So just adding to it, already been said, uh, for us, you know, that's what prompted us to start um, the programs of both the LMA and the, um, and the LPN space. We were a paying traveler at that level of premium for that level of, of uh, individual that was extraordinary. And um, to be frank, the quality was not necessarily what we were accustomed to as well. So you have to balance that there's a cost and quality equation as well. So definitely um, is uh, the business case for us is it was easy to make. It was a no-brainer when, um, and I just want to be clear, I didn't um, develop these programs, my, my team did. Um, and they've been a phenomenal job putting these together. But I asked for that business case, it's very clear um, that if we can uh, educate people locally, uh, and remember that to, to Dina's point, um, nurses travel now. Um, the new grads that come out of nursing school want to travel. That's what they want to do. Um, they, it's just a different um, mental model than certainly when I graduated a, a number of years ago. And so what we really are targeting is people that want um, to start a family and live in Vermont, mm -hmm. right? And so what we've been successful, and I guess my colleagues have as well, is we've actually enticed some travelers to stay. So, um, you know, so if we can bring them to our organization, they're coming at a premium, but if we can show them the love and let them see how wonderful it is to work at Center for Law Medical Center and be part of our amazing team and live in this beautiful state and we expose them to all of that. We had two people from Los Angeles that stayed and are working on that surge right now, a husband, wife. That to me was, that made my day, right? Um, we started the year, I think our peak for travelers, um, we had 30, we're down to and so for us, that we have 1,700 employees, um, we're down to 15. And, that, and that's good, we still have a ways to go. And I just want to echo, it's not just direct care providers that are in this traveler space. And I, I smiled when uh, we talked about the farm tech program, thank you, because one of our travelers is a farm tech. Um, so we, we are seeing travelers in more um, disciplines as well. And then the other thing from us, from just an operational issue, and I guess some of our smaller organizations have the same challenge, we can, um, our census can double in a day. Mm -hmm. So we can go from having 45 patients to 80 plus patients in a day. Um, and having practiced previously at UDMMC, I think if I walked into any of those rooms and said we're gonna double your census in a day, they'd run me out of town. Um, but in a community hospital, that is not uncommon. So we have to understand how we can stabilize some of those peaks and valleys um, in a way that makes sense for us. Um, and so that's another operational challenge we're looking at um, as well. So we can um, kind of, very difficult to flex from uh, 45 to, to 80 patients. And that's actually what got us into the traveler business this year, um, is, is that, really peak census, and we talked about during our budget hearings that we are all seeing aged um, patients with multiple comorbidities. These individuals are very sick, um, and they come back. 
repeatedly. Uh, we had a, re a readmission initiative. We reduced our readmissions by 12 percent. Thank goodness we did, because if we hadn't, um, our margin would have looked even worse. So those are the very real operational uh, issues we're all challenged with, and I think the strength comes in the partnerships with some of what you've seen exemplified here today. Very important for us long term. One, one more quick one. Um, when I was uh, visiting um, the North Country Hospital, I was talking to the CFO who said to me that uh, we were talking about ideas and, and trying to downsize the travelers and upsize the kind of more stable staff. And he had what I thought was a good idea uh, in terms of trying to help people with their mortgages so that it's mm -hmm. to, to kind of get them to stay rather than student loans, which makes keeps them more mobile is to get them invested in, in, in a piece of property. And what he said when he presented it to his board, um, there was, not from the board, but there was a, almost immediate pushback from people in the community who felt, you know, these all these great jobs in the hospital and, and now they're giving them, you know, uh, additional enhancement. And then from, even from inside the hospital staff, you know, who are saying, well, if you're gonna give it to them, you should give it to us. And I'm just wondering if, is that, um, is that, dynamic kind of uh, been watered down enough because people see that that um, in, in the more global sense that hiring travelers is not the best use of money. Well, I would say that um, usually folks are relieved that a traveler is there because there's a need. Um, and it's really how do you enculturate them into the environment and create a space for them to feel uh, part of your, your organization. Um, and also, you know, it's telling the story because, you know, I think travelers, you look at their, their compensation, they're not receiving that, their agency is. And also, when you look at the uh, cost of a, a clinical nurse, you know, you're adding fringe on that, your benefits, your earn time. These folks don't have that. So, um, you know, I know that's helped, uh, you know, tell that story, what it truly means to be a traveler. Uh, it, I think um, by label, it, it seems, because it is an expensive source, it's $90 an hour for a specialty, you get into critical pay, crisis pay, and it, it's definitely uh, a big bulk. So I believe it's really how do you enculturate, and my experience is, um, they're there at a critical time when your workforce is low. Um, you know, we're always in the business to hire permanent, and I appreciate Anna, you know, it's that re-recruit and um, put the hook in and have somebody convert to permanent. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank, this is a great presentation, and I think, you know, we really stand where many of the problems are, starting with, you know, the students not being able to afford the education, to the education not being able to necessarily afford setting up new programs, to, you know, the hospital is not able to pay for enough people and, um, because they're not there. And so I just, you know, wonder, one of the things, too, is it's kind of like we're on this gerbil wheel where we're, we're really trying to forecast now what's going to happen in the next three to five years and we're trying to fill all these spots and everything and we tend to even be a little more disadvantaged and you know this is a national problem as you said there's 100,000 doctors going to be missing and you know we're looking for a small piece of them and so just trying to look at you know what other things can we do in the future rather than just you know try to do the same thing as we go forward and I, I think that um you know, Dr. Davidson brought up some of that with the, you know, really looking for preventive medicine and population health and, you know, how do we get into the telemedicine? How do we change things in the future? Because we can sit here and, and try to set up all these programs and you guys are doing wonderful things and you're doing some scholarship programs, but a lot of the numbers you're you were talking about are still relatively small. You know, you'll say we have 15 students here, 15 there. I mean, we're talking really large numbers that we're going to need. And so, you know, it, I think part of it is going to, in some ways, probably force us to really get some of the waste out of the system, be more efficient, find new ways to do things. And, 
you know, just how do we get that into this whole workforce thing too? Because I think everything you're saying with childcare, with trailing spouses, with, you know, diversity makes it more and more challenging to get people here. And so we can try all these things, which we're gonna to try to do, right? And try to fill the gaps, but we could be here in five years or 10 years and the problem is even bigger. So, you know, I don't know that necessarily that there's an answer. I mean, I think this was all fascinating and, you know, hearing each piece, but, you know, one, one underlying theme I heard almost across from everything is everybody needs money, which I understand that, but where do we get it? You know, it's either coming from either the hospital's paying for things and maybe they can do that with ROIs for the programs. It's gotta come from taxes if the state's gonna pay for it. I mean, it's probably not, that's probably not gonna happen. So, you know, and, and student debt and everything else, I mean, until there's some big fundamental changes, it's, it's a tough thing to solve. So just don't know if anyone can talk to things about how we're working on just, you know, upending the system in a way and changing things and you know what is the medical system going to look like in 10 or 15 years you know i mean we love to say we love to hope it's all going to fit together right but you know i've only been on the board for three years but this is the you know one of the biggest problems we've had which is workforce 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 but it's not just across this area right it was i was in the corporate world before really tough to get people to come here and when they came many of them would leave because it just didn't fit their needs, so don't know if anyone has an answer or any <laughs> suggestions, because it's a tough thing, and I'm just I'm not trying to you know, rain on the parade, it's just, it's, it is a huge issue, which it's like we, you know, we need some really big, amazing ideas to try to change it, I guess. Well, one thought is that, you know, there probably isn't one big silver bullet that's gonna do it. Uh, being a half full kind of guy, I mean, just listening to what's going on here tells me that we're heading in the right direction. And to me, it, it is those partnerships. What we talked about the Brownboro, Northwest, and Southwest, and Central Vermont, and there are more. Uh, once we learn what's working, you know, we've got to keep building on those. And, uh, I mean, I, I, so I, try, I try to take more optimistic perspective and say, look, well, you're never going to get to. You know, a lot, but we're, 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 we're heading in a good direction. We need to expand what we're doing. Yeah, I, and I just say also that, um, Maureen, just, I mean, not sort of echoing what you said. Like in medicine, I, we also, when I'm treating patients, I think about standardization um, leads to reliability, but it's innovation that leads to improved outcomes. So I think it's not being afraid to fail. Like the, the mortgage example, to me, I can see the problems with it, but why don't we push, you know, they should try to push forward a little bit, and maybe some rendition, not exactly it was originally thought about, leads to that improved outcome. Yeah, I would, um, the couple of things I'm thinking about is, um, it's really a multi-pronged approach, but um, one of the things, and I think Trey actually addressed it, is thinking about telehealth in this rural setting. Um, when I think about that from a nursing perspective, there's expert eyes, right? So can I think about a different care delivery model that can afford uh, potentially, and I hesitate to say this, but you know, if RNs are at a shortage, what could that look like? But I need a nurse and or a physician to respond um, in these rural settings to be able to have those expert eyes. You always need somebody to deliver care. But if we don't have that resource, um, is there an opportunity? I think we, you know, we need to think about that. And how does that become affordable and or reimbursable um, for organizations? I mean, I think that the whole focus on pop, pop health and really looking at where we're, we're investing our dollars in the healthcare system is going to be critical to this. All of these things have to be running in parallel at the same time. I mean, the reality is well, why we started the CCA program is to shift the cost base in our practices, right? So we, we didn't need our RNs doing the things they were doing. We need our RNs to be in different spaces. And we needed those RNs to work at the top of their license. And this is a, a, a perfect role. That entry role in the CCA was a, a great way to address the need, but at a much lower cost base. We're starting to look at um, medication tests. 
um, in the nursing home space. Um, that's, um, that is appropriate in the state of Vermont. It isn't in New York State, but in the state of Vermont, you can um, train, um, educate someone to be passing those medications in a skilled nursing facility. That's a huge difference in cost of having an RM do that. Um, and remember, the population we're treating in that, in, in that space is very different than the acute care setting. I need the acute care setting to have those expert nurses. Um, so it really is looking across in a very holistic way um, on how we can really shift um, some of our care mechanisms so that they really advantage um, and drive the value wealth and the cost down. At the same time, the trace point and making sure we're improving the outcomes. We are going to have to leverage um, telemedicine, no question. Um, that, that's key going forward. And we are testing some of those pilots now. We're doing that with um, some Vermont hospice and home health. We have a, a, a monitor in our, some of those individuals' homes um, so that we don't, a nurse doesn't have to go in there. And they work with us on the acute care setting to monitor those patients. So those kind of innovations are ongoing now and more of that needs to happen. There's so much of that going on. What we have to do is study the ones that get the most leverage and then replicate those more system-wide. I think the other thing that we you know, um, have to think about, and I'll just use higher education as an example. You know, even though we think we're really progressive, we're not very, we're pretty stuck. And I think that you know, people, it's, it goes back to the question, Kevin, you asked about graduation rates. You know, the way people are accessing education is not our, is not, is not what we are familiar with, what we um, know about. And so I think real, I think the same way if we're going to attract a workforce of younger people, they really want things very different than what we, you know, they are going to change from six or eight times. What's important to them? They, they want it, they want a lot more free time. They don't have the loyalty to one institution. That, so how do we design jobs that really speak to that? And so I think if you really want to get, you know, and we can tweak around the edges and we can make some changes and we can do different programs and things. But I think really, you can really think really radically different about what kind of environment is attractive to the 20 to 35 year old and what fits with their lifestyle. And so, you know, telecommuting is a very big thing. Why did you know, like I have people all the time saying to me, you know, like I, I work for CC, but I want to work at home. Well, you know, like right now, I'm like, oh, well, we're sort of, you know, we need to. And then I have to realize that, you know, people, a lot of our students access their advisors now, you know, texting, email. It's very different. You know, they don't want to come in and meet face to face with an advisor. I think about, you know, the other day I said to my nephew who's at college, I said, you should go talk to your advisor. He looked at me like I had a head. Like, why am I, I'm going to have to walk across campus and talk to him. No, I'll text him. You know, and I'm like, you know, face to face might be good. But, you know, that wasn't what, but that, but I think we have to think about that when we're designing jobs that really speak to, I don't have any silver boilers, but I think about those things a lot in terms of really how do we how do we design something that feels very And I different. think to that it's, it's you know we, we can kind of, we can see what the millennials are doing yeah. you know not to stereotype because there's a lot yeah. of great things that they do yeah. and I have two of them but they do change jobs every two yeah. years you yeah. know mm -hmm. companies aren't necessarily giving you know yeah. they don't get the yeah. silver packages anymore but what is it going to be in another ten years yeah. right? so right. it, you know it's going to be different yeah. than what this group yeah. is than what that group is and you will yeah. have right a lot more work at home and flexibility and how do you do that in a hospital setting or in a medical setting, but yeah, it's yeah. going to be interesting. I think it's how do you, how do you be responsive and in what, you know, yes, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, there's certain, you know, core things, but are there some things that would, would challenge us to really think differently? Like students now want, like, you know, for so many years, a 15-week semester is pretty standard. Well, now students are much happier taking the course seven weeks. You know, and then it's like, oh, is there enough academic, you know, is there enough quality? I think quality? we would have been happy back then, take it something <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think really thinking, really meeting their needs in a way that doesn't radically change what we're doing, but it, there are some adjustments we can, we can all make, I think. And I really agree with Jeff that uh, I think the glass is half full because what we've heard people say is that uh, the people who are applying whether it's to nursing school or to medical school, there's a, a large turn down rate just because the capacity isn't there. So we do have somewhat the ability to grow our own, and the only way we're ever gonna be successful because this is a national problem, 
is to grow our own. And so I think that uh, there's a lot that can be done, and even the work that um, Gabe is doing can, can make such a meaningful difference if we can make it easier to precept, and we have to push our medical community to, it's, it's a lot of work to precept, um, but it needs to be done, and, and if we all come together, I think that we can at least alleviate the problem, if not uh, solve it. So, Jess. Oh, that's okay, thank you. I agree, and I actually want to thank Kevin for facilitating this panel because I think it's really important. It's something that you put a lot of your own effort and interest in and trying to think about workforce issues. And thank you all for coming. Um, Gabe, I want to say to you first, I'm so glad you mentioned the nurse licensure compact because it was something that I looked up at the end of the summer um, to understand it better because I had a conversation with a, a family friend whose daughter is in nursing school down in Virginia. And I said, fantastic, we need nurses. I hope she's coming back. And he said, oh no, she's not coming back. She wanted to come back, but she's getting her degree in Virginia and Vermont is not a part of this licensing, comp licensing compact and there's 34 other states that she can get jobs in. So she's not coming back, at least not in the near term. So then I quickly looked at why are we not in this, trying to understand why would we be losing Vermonters that want to come back and stay in the state. So I just, I know you're working on it. I just want to say, please work on it. <laughs> yes, I also want to say there's a perception of reality gradient there too. Um, okay. That's a silly reason for her to have stayed in Virginia. Right. She could right. come to Vermont and have a nursing license out of that office down the street within 24 hours of completing her application based on having passed the okay. MCAS. We have to change that perception, but, right? But it is, I mean, perception becomes reality. If you have one of these compact licenses, you look at that colored map and that's the menu. And you don't inquire into Little Vermont because it's very burdensome to figure out the requirements of states like us. Yeah. Um, but it is, you know, I don't want to oversell the gradient between now and then. Now you can get a nursing license out of our office in, in the same day you finish it. Okay, well I would definitely but that's the tell us. Though. That, but that's the millennial. It That's is. It is. And I, well, they're risk of, I, I reject the idea that millennials are different. I think their environment <laughs> is different. Yeah. And they're, they're on the, coming on the heels of people who are badly burned by uh, promises that educational debt was never bad. They weren't trying to be a horrible idea. But as we try to grow our own, as the chairman has suggested, I think the thing that we can do from a credentialing perspective is to protect those intermediate stops. You know, if you, if you talk to engineers and say, how about I, how about I make a staircase? that goes 10 flights up with no landings, the engineer will say, please put landings in. People are going to get tired on the way up, and some of them are going to fall, and we want them to stop on the way. And, but for something that's somehow different in our professional training system, and, and we need those intermediate levels so that it isn't such a daunting thing to say, I want to be a physical therapist, but if I don't make it, the consequence shouldn't be that I'm a quarter million dollars in debt with no credential. And same for, for bachelor's level nursing. And so I think it's very important that we protect the, the landings, that we protect the intermediate stops, so that somebody who has gotten three quarters of the way up has a place to land uninjured. And um, th that's why I think protecting those intermediate levels in nursing is very important. And I really wince when I hear that everybody with a BSN, I think half yeah, our, our, our RN workforce doesn't have one and things seem to be OK and don't mess with it. And um, so I do think we have to be really careful. And all of you will learn as you're operating in the institutions that you are, that there is this relentless credential escalator. We know we're sitting on two health science professions that our legislature thinks are baccalaureate professions that have just started to require clinical doctorates through their creditors. And if that isn't stopped, um, we're, we're gonna have a, a bigger problem, but I don't know that um, we all have a handle on where these pressures are coming from. I can turn it down as it's coming out of our office and everybody's on board with that, but we're not an exclusive input. Okay, well, thank you. Um, Sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> Just wanted to say, keep working on that, minimizing transactions cost of getting credentials in the state, I think is really important. Um, obviously, as we're facing these shortages, I think about it, you could have financial incentives like, you know, Steve was saying, you just have to up the wages. But, you know, it sounds like a lot of folks are starting to think about the non-financial enticements or being creative, some creative solutions. Um, and I'm wondering, so if childcare, for example, turns out to be an impediment to residencies or an impediment to, you know, uh, workforce, hospitals, for example, are investing in housing. Why not on-site childcare? And particularly if you're, for example, I'm going to call out UVM here, but if you have UVM undergraduate college right there with an early childhood education program, why not, you know, or CCB not? with early childhood ed, right? Like, so 
I just will throw out there, has that been a consideration? If that's an obstacle, and hospitals are already investing in other ways in their community, why not on-site child care? So we, we've had it um, at, in, at SPMC for, I don't know, 20-something years, and it's been a huge way to recruit in um, all, all types of staff, um, from, you know, nurses, physicians. We don't, it's, the program's not near as big. Um, 2009 financial hit, really, that was the first place that had to go down, and we haven't been able to expand it back. Uh, but it has been very, very successful in that way. Is that, so other, other hospitals have this, and is we're in partnership with um, Downstreet and Capstone um, in the Berlin area um, for both affordable housing and um, the child care. Uh, and so we're, again, it's early in that discussion, but we're, we're looking at those type of partnerships um, because we're, we're not necessarily in that space, but we can partner with, uh, with others and they have that expertise. They have a Head Start program as an example in Capstone. And so we want to leverage their expertise and just partner with them to provide that um, child care for our employees. So that's a com those are conversations that are just initiated now. Okay. Um, and, you know, the other thought, thought I had was uh, typically when we face workforce shortages, maybe not in our current climate, but visas and, you know, attracting foreign workers to fill workforce shortages. And I'm just wondering, um, has there been conversations around exploiting any kind of visa, relaxed visa restriction, you know, uh, restrictions for foreign nurses or anything like that, particularly as it relates to diversity issues and things like that? So I'm just wondering if that's been a topic conversation or exploration. You know, I, um, not currently at NMC, but I do have experience understanding um, the recruitment and visa. Uh, using agencies that really it's it's difficult in terms of um, jumping through all the loopholes however places you know companies do it well <clears throat> what you have to really consider is your culture um, in particular I would say in the Vermont region because folks um, will come from the Philippines or maybe India and, and look at and assimilating them into your culture and environment as well as um, our patient population that we're caring for. Uh, it, it could be perceived differently. So there are barriers there, but there are organizations, and I believe UVM, uh, the medical center may be uh, utilizing international travelers uh, within their organization. Uh, but it's certainly something that, um, you know, I believe most places, if you're, you're unable, that that might be an opportunity. Yeah, I guess uh, I wasn't thinking of, I was thinking more permanent. Yeah, than yeah, so most yeah, of the agreements that you have um, will have them come, and uh, they'll have a two-year contract or an agreement with a conversion rate, and some of them are like at about 60% people will convert, but what you need to do is build community. So, mm -hmm. for example, I don't know who mentioned um, the, well, I don't have an Asian market, but if you bring that community, church is really important, you have to wrap around that nurse or those folks that are coming from a foreign country, in particular in our state, related to uh, not having that same diversity. Um, and similar to our uh, border state, New Hampshire, that is uh, also a common uh, issue in, in that area. And for, for physicians, you know, um, probably yeah. J1 visas, 30 in the um, state of Vermont. Vermont's like the only state that doesn't fill those 30. I'm not really um, uh, that knowledgeable about it, just enough to, to know that we have several physicians that come through J1. You have to pay for them, um, but it's, it's worth it. Yeah, I'm familiar with some, some hospitalist services that come on a J1 and really great. Okay. I, I will say though that for the first time in, in many years we had some residents and fellows that were supposed to matriculate in and could not because they couldn't get their visas. So that's yes. the flip side. We're, uh, this is this is the world that we're living in right now. Yeah, I recognize we're in a different world. Um, and I'll just share this with you I, and I wish I could have found the article but I had seen this maybe about six months ago but it was about a rural hospital somewhere in the Midwest or out west that was trying to recruit rural you know, workforce there. And one of the ways in which they did that was recognizing that those people who are interested in, in working in underserved areas 
Um, typically are also the same types of individuals who want to go do sort of uh, Doctors Without Borders right. or some of these foreign, you know, volunteer. And so one of the perks that they offered to try and attract those individuals was paid time mm -hmm. to go to Haiti after a, yeah. you know, an earthquake or a, you know, an event. So in some ways attracting those type of individuals who would probably like to work in the sort of areas. So I'm not sure, I, I, there's not a question, so I'll throw it out there. I wish I had the article because I could give you more details, but it seemed interesting and it seemed like it was successful in that particular hospital. And the last thing I'll just uh, throw out there is it seems to me if we have the highest high school graduation rate, and yet we have among the lowest high, higher ed enrollment rate, initiatives about trying to get people into the healthcare profession have to start in the high school. Middle school. So, middle, middle school, okay, middle yeah. school, high school. So I'm just wondering, we didn't hear very much about that, and I'm wondering, you know, is the Agency of Education on board with this? Are there any initiatives happening to attract people to the healthcare profession in high school, telling them about the financial rewards, the tuition reimbursements, the job security, all the wonderful things that a career in healthcare does. What are we doing at the high school? Middle school. Well, I, I can just speak in general, not necessarily to the healthcare field. One of the things that we, we have started, we just keep, you know, for so many years, we were just focused on adults, and then we started to see more and more younger students coming, and then we're realizing that we just need to, if we're really gonna make a change in the number of students who are continuing any form of education, um, that we have to keep dipping lower. And so one of the things we do now is we do middle school access days with, and it's all with philanthropic support, but bringing all grades, we can't keep up with the demand for bringing grades and to spend a, a half day or a day at CPD sampling, you know, mini courses. It, because it really is, it's, it's I think Anna, you talked about it, you know, in terms of, um, it's, it's a huge leap for people, for so many kids to imagine that they could go to college. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say that I think another piece that's happening is families are simply taking themselves out of the college game in elementary school because of the student loan debt narrative that's out there. So I think anything that we can do to talk about, the ch you know, to change the narrative that either school isn't worth the time <coughs> or the money, um, because what's happening is people from higher income brackets are going, their kids are going to college at the same rate they always have. It's people from lower and middle that are hearing that narrative and like saying, you know, right in middle school, you know, we cannot afford for you to go to college. So there's a lot of work not only in getting people interested in the healthcare field, but just interested in continue, thinking that there's a possibility for that they could continue education. And we're just seeing growth, just are not even, it's not even in the, I, yeah, I was just gonna say, I can imagine if you had the middle school and the high school going to the hospitals yeah. and yeah. learning about what you'd like to yeah. be a tech and what you'd like to be a nurse, and, you know, yeah. and then learning about the yeah. tuition reimbursement and how it is affordable, you know, but having them go to the, the hospitals. Yeah. And, you know, yes, so we, have, there. Yeah. we have, um, we started a program a couple of years ago called Being Just and Beyond, and it's an open house for those high school students in the surrounding areas to come in and, you know, they can uh, uh, tour the OR. They can go to the wound care center. They can go up onto the floor. Um, to get them exposed to what it's like being in, in a hospital. AHEC also has a program yes. called Wet Medquist. Yes. Um, and we host about 20 high school students through this program. Um, and we actually just did one, I think, just a couple of weeks ago. I tried to get a couple of them interested in health care administration, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's not something about the hospital ministry. But, <laughs> but those are the kind of things absolutely most of us are, are, are engaged in. And those are formalized programs, again, AHEC and in uh, uh, Browns with, the, with our local high schools, uh, bandages and beyond. And the staff loves it because the staff is so proud of what they do in sharing that experience. And the parents provide a, um, a cafeteria for the parents who can be there waiting for their, as the kids go through their different um, um, the different experiences of the different departments. So and we all as adults have to change the conversation too because yeah. there's that false narrative that you have to leave Vermont um, to be successful and yet we know that that's not true. There's lots of opportunity here and we need to spread the message to let kids know because a lot of kids really do want to stay in Vermont but they had it ingrained in them that the only way they're going to be successful is to seek opportunities elsewhere. So I, I just think that we are part of the problem ourselves. I think one, one of the things, you know, I've served on a number of these panels, and there's a panel next week that uh, Peter Wells is having uh, on nurse retention or improvement in the workforce. And I think it's uh, 
and at your place. Yeah, um, I'm but I'm it's sorry. one of the things, and, and soon I'm sitting next to Jeff. So I think one of the things we're missing here, we've got to formalize the relationship between the hospitals and the uh, healthcare organizations with higher education in the state of Vermont. And we've talked about it. You're doing some phenomenal programs at Northwestern. You're doing great things at uh, uh, Central Vermont. We're doing things at Brattleboro. But there's not, the, I don't think there's this collaboration or uh, uh, a master plan. Or, or an opportunity for, for um, that we hardwired between the relationships we have with higher ed and the hospitals. And whether that's a commission of, of uh, blue, uh, blue ribbon panel, blue ribbon, um, because I, I don't know how you make your decisions at the, at the schools um, in which programs to participate, or is it all at the local level? And I think we're kind of siloed in that in each one of our communities. But I think we need a bring it up, whether it's um, Jeff Tiemann's in the audience from the Hospital Association, working with you, Jeff, to, to kind of put all this together um, so that we're, why should I replicate a program that you're doing in Barry for CCAs or LPNs? I'm doing it in, for LPNs as well in Brattleboro. It seems like we've got to, got to get our act together and, and create a, a, a different forum that's really hardwired so that um, everyone in Vermont knows about these programs um, and we can standardize the programs across whether it's CCD, VDC, university, the system as well. So that's my pitch because I think a lot of stuff is being done, um, but we've got to elevate it. The other thing is we talk so much about money, but we really need to start to look at what's motivating the millennials too, which is a, a real deep desire to serve. And when you can pitch a profession that the, at the end of the day you help someone, you, you've got a lot to sell. So with that, I'm going to open it up to the public for questions or comments. Yes, Deb. Hello. Um, I have a question for Mr. Gilman. On the nursing licensure compact, so I know it's a very fluid model. Have they compared it to states with similar cost of living in Vermont, though? Retention rate? Sure, we did a lot of modeling on that, and we'll actually be filing a supplement to it to the initial report that we filed with the uh, legislature. Um, but I mean, a number of these states in the compact do have comparable um, cost of living, um, and we did quite a bit of modeling of you know trying to anticipate who would move in, who would move out, etc. And as far as the cost of the nursing license now? The, I, I, we actually did calculate the cost of the increased cost of the nursing license, and that was one of the big hangups that prevented um, movement, I think, in the first half of the biennium, was uncertainty about whether the licensed population found that a worthwhile trade-off. Um, because um, in, our, in our licensing system, uh, each unit is self-contained. I mean, the nursing board's expenses are borne by licensees, and it's, ju it's just uh, expenses divided by licensees, and that's your fee. Um, and so the question became, do they want to bear, does the community of licensees want to bear that cost? Uh, with, the, with the cooperation of the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, uh, we were able to do what I think is a quite objective and credible um, survey of our uh, nurse population that had an extraordinary response rate for a survey of that type um, came back highly favorable. You know, we th I think we, by parsing it and looking at it, who liked it and who didn't, we were able to learn some interesting things, but um, in terms of net approval and, and acceptance of the idea that it would be a worthwhile expense to the licensee, all thumbs up. Because the 240 will make us the most expensive in the country, won't it? I don't know where we'll be nationally, and some of it depends how you parse it. Um, you know, when we, there's no question that we are comparatively expensive in terms of biennial fee, but we're also settling in, you know, whether you have a teacher's license or a nurse's license, it's pretty typical in Vermont that the, the administrative cost settles in around 100 a year if you have an enforcement apparatus attached to it, which is expensive. Um, but I, I think the one nice thing about Vermont's model is that we do not impose expensive regulatory burdens like continuing education on nurses. Um, 
in many professions, I think people fixate on the licensing fee, which isn't to say it's not important, but forget, you know, you can have a, a compliance fee that's both utterly pointless and very expensive and quintuples the, quintuples the actual fee you pay every two years and nobody blinks twice, and, I, and it's, it's sort of weird. But you're right, I think nationally we are, at, at post-compact, we will be on the high end, certainly in the high quartile. And I think, um, and I appreciate your comment about the BSNs as a working nurse. I've been, I was an ABN graduate. I've been working in critical care at the medical center for the last 18 years. Um, as we keep pushing for the BSN role in nursing, I almost feel like our profession is shooting itself in the foot a little bit um, by not appreciating what the LPNs can do and the fact that an ADN nurse passed the exact same test as a BSN nurse to become a licensed nurse. And what's happening though is in a lot of our hospitals, we are having to do the continuing education credits because not only do they appreciate BSNs, they want nurses to all be certified in special areas. Mm -hmm. So there is increasing costs that are going on at hospital levels. Um, my other um, question was about retention and a lot of our hospitals are offering like eight thousand dollars to come move to, to come to Vermont and six thousand in relocation costs, and they're only asking them to stay for two years. And what we're seeing is those nurses are staying for two years and they're leaving. I have several friends who have gone to travel. Some have come back to our own hospital to travel, being paid sixty dollars an hour, but they're also getting six hundred dollars a week for living expenses. So their rent's being paid for, they're not hurting in any way, shape, or form. I guess my question really is about what are we doing about retaining nurses? Because it costs fifty to sixty-five thousand dollars to train a new nurse in your facility, and then two years later they're gone to travel. So what are we going to do about retaining the nurses that are here? One thought that I had was we need to get the state more involved. The state is not investing nearly enough in our educational programs, especially health care educational programs. We need to really boost that. And what if we looked at something like a five-year plan? You bring a nurse to our state or a new graduate in our state and say, you stay with our facility or any facility in Vermont, whatever makes you happy, because we want you to be happy and stay here. You stay for five years and we will offer tuition for um, in, I mostly cold water for me, I think. Um, there's really no superior substitute to cash compensation. Um, and when we, you know, and every time there's a workplace, especially at the top of the business cycle, and we hear this from in the, in the mental health counseling fields at the master's level, desperate need, and people are always asking, you know, what if we give them a state Prius and they can drive it around while we're here? <laughs> you get more money! And um, so I, I think at some point um, we run into a lot of unintended consequences with that. And if you have a long-term employment contract or a commitment before you the payoff, you can wind up inadvertently placing unhappy people in unhappy situations they can't leave. And, well, and, that's, and that's why I said if you're not like say they came to work in my medical center yeah. and it just wasn't a fit for them, but there was some place else in Vermont that did fit for them. As long as they're staying in our state and yeah. working in our profession. I mean, we can't compete. Dartmouth right now is offering $25,000 sign-on bonuses to critical care nurses that they're getting in their first paycheck. We can't compete with that in the state. It depends. I mean, I don't think you can he compete head-to-head -head with it. But I think that anybody who is moving across the country for $2,500 is making a very short sight, if that's the only input, is making a very short sight. Well, no, we're losing nurses at our hospital that are going to Dartmouth, and I'm moving across the country for $25,000 I, I was off by a decimal, I may change my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's very hard. I mean, it's a very hard nut to crack. I, you know, we can do what we can to make um, it more pleasant and less expensive to get here, but ultimately the compensation gradient is um, something that no one of us is going to No, fix. and I agree, and we can't fix the cost of living. That's why, like, every one of the panelists has been saying it's about loan forgiveness and how do we make it attractive to stay here and ask for more than a two-year commitment so people have a chance to put down roots in our state. 
Yeah, I, I, it's a real challenge. I think I'm the only, I mean, I almost agree with everything that you said, except that I'd be very reluctant to um, extract commitments from people contractually or otherwise, because it has, it has some unintended consequences. Okay, other members of the public? Jeff. I uh, just wanted to thank the Green Mountain Fair Board for hosting this forum. This issue is so important for everyone on the panel, for all the providers in the state, and for the patients we serve. Um, and for your kind of constant attention to this at hospital budget hearings and other forums where this topic is also relevant. So I just want to thank you for convening the group. And to Steve's point about the role the hospital association can play, you know, a lot of great ideas have surfaced today, um, some of which I was aware of and some that I wasn't. And so one thing we've been talking about at Boz is how to create kind of a, a clearinghouse of some kind to share this information across our really pretty small membership. Um, and, and be able to get that information out to people who can use it effectively. So we're working on that and welcome input. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Other members of the public? Yes, Susan. Um, Susan Aronoff from the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. And I want to um, echo Jeff and thank the Green Mountain Fair Board for holding this panel. And I'd like to encourage you to hold a similar panel with similar expertise and maybe some of the exact same people, especially Joyce Judy, to focus on a different healthcare workforce, a home and community-based workforce, which loses workers all the time to the hospital workforce. Um, so someone at a designated agency gets a license and certification and then they can earn a heck of a lot more at a hospital. That story, we know that story. But I don't know if the Green Mountain Care Board knows that story. I mean, we, I, I work for people who depend on services provided by the designated and specialized services agency, by home health nurses, by choices for care programs that are med Medicaid funded. And that workforce has similar problems and constraints, but I would say they're even worse. And so we have people who get approved to receive hours of support in the community, high-tech nursing support, you know, the the parents of the most medically fragile kids will get approved for hours of care for their kids, but they can't fill 50% of their hours. So it's a different set of pressures, but I'd really love to see a panel um, on the home and community-based workforce and the pressures to that workforce is. When Al Gobe was chair from the Green Mountain Care Board, and he took the legislature had him review the budget of one of the designated agencies, Howard Mental Health, he made the comment that these guys don't even grow at the rate of inflation. You can run the hamburger stand that didn't grow at the rate of inflation. So we know the hospital's budget, at least have been growing, the designated and specialized services agencies, the home health agencies, uh-uh, not even the rate of inflation. So different sets of pressures, but it'd be wonderful to have a workforce uh, panel. So I think hopefully we can unite to try to solve the problem yeah. rather than divide the problem. Well, and then I did have one very specific question for the gentleman from the Office of Professional Regulation. One issue that would really benefit maybe the hospital workforce, that kind of home community based, is if Vermont was able to employ more to what are called community health workers. And I know that when the Affordable Care Act was passed, there was an opportunity for states to be able to tap Medicaid funding to reimburse a new set of people that was gotten kind of hung up with the Office of Professional Regulations. So I just wonder, has there been any progress made? Did we modify our state plan? Did we create a category of people that could be paid? This, this workforce is like the peer workforce that's so effective <coughs> with people in recovery from mental health, people in recovery from addiction, people with disabilities, to be able to pay peers who don't have necessarily the traditional background have we made progress? Um, none in terms of that being a credential that's been proposed. Um, you, you've hit upon this really interesting problem that we find in this field, which is that uh, simultaneous to people like me singing about you know liberalizing the marketplace and letting things work and not regulating things that don't need regulating, we do see third-party payers wanting the, credent the creation of credentials that wouldn't need to be created in order to open a revenue stream. And you can have a very um, perverse effect from that too. We have a mental health where providers are holding three licenses for something that any one of them would have let them legally do, and they're paying for it. 
And um, so I think it's, it's a kind of a careful what you wish for thing, but I, I'm too ignorant of that particular um, federal designation to tell you where it is. I do know uh, I haven't seen a proposal that it be created as a credential. Okay, other members of the public, yes, sir. Yeah, hi, I'm Robert Patterson. I work at CDMC. I'm the Vice President of Human Resources and Clinical Operations. And I'd like to thank you as well for having this panel. I learned a lot in hearing what others are doing. Um, I've had the benefit of working with others to kind of do some of this uh, innovative creation of some of these um, development programs this year. Um, you know, one question I have that, um, and I think Steve, you hit on this, that was really interesting was that you know, we're, we're, we kind of uh, talked a little bit around the uh, 3,900 positions that we're gonna need over the next couple of years for nursing. Knowing that, you know, and I looked at AHAC had a report called Vermont's Future of Nursing that came out. And they're stating in that report that there was about 265 RN positions, or RN graduates in 2017. I don't know if that number's changed since then. Just that seems the, those numbers, you know, if you look at it from the top of the house, do not seem to add up well for that. We're going to be able to really kind of meet the ongoing need. And we know over the next uh, 15, 20 years, we're gonna have a doubling of the folks that are 65 and above. So certainly there's gonna be a lot of demand. So I would imagine the pressure for us to have even more nurses is going to increase. Um, you know, I, I really think it's um, a big piece of the pie for us to be innovative and come up with programming. But I'm also wondering, what are we doing from the state in order to just kind of um, decrease that bottleneck of graduates? I think we already heard that there's um, plenty of interest in just getting into an RN program. However, there's not the capacity to get folks to um, actually enroll just because of limitations <coughs> in the number of instructors, professors, and so on. So it seems to me like we need to really look at this from a high level and how are we going to hit that demand to come up with some pretty strategic uh, plans to kind of address that. I'm just wondering if that's been an area of focus. I would say that's a, it's a, an important topic. And to be honest, I don't really know the answer. I mean, I know what we've already talked about, for, uh, everything from you know, getting the clinical placements to the instructors, the receptors, but those all seem surmountable. Sorry. Uh, I think one of the things um, to look at is we have a lot of nurses, um, BSN nurses, that have master's degrees in <coughs> nursing, but health administration, other master's level preparedness, and they should be able to qualify for being an instructor, whether it's an LPN or an RN. And I think that's one of the things um, the university system needs to really look at. Um, because someone that has 20 years of the nurse that is semi-retiring by clinical care, that has a BSN, that has a master's degree, should be able, doesn't have to necessarily be a master's in nursing. That person has some phenomenal skills. And why could that person impart that, that knowledge base to new students, to new nursing students? I think the board needs to look at that. I think the board does give the option of an alternate master's uh, degree, not just nursing. I think there's some, some challenges within the university system of moving to a different degree, not just that master's in nursing. This is a suggestion. Some of these we can talk about more. The <laughs> 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 other members of the public. John. Yeah, John Olson from the State Office of Rural Health and Primary Care. One of the things that we do in addition to supporting hospitals in a number of ways is collect uh, the data and print, uh, analyze it and uh, publish reports on the 40 plus healthcare professions that many of which are um, licensed through the OPR. Um, we publish those reports on our, um, our web page and we also have a number of maps that show the distribution and the relative um, uh, Variation or uh, variation of um, distribution among different parts of the state. So those are available. Just Google Health Workforce Vermont and look to our pages. The other thing, uh, Steve, thank you for uh, bringing up the work that AHEC has been doing for years um, with uh, promoting healthcare professions to middle middle school and high school students. 
Um, they've been doing a tremendous amount of work, uh, so I don't need to repeat that. What I will say is that we also manage those um, grants to AHEC uh, to support their work, and those um, budget lines have not increased in 10 years uh, to support that work of both the UVM AHEC program office um, as well as the two regional AHECs. So that is something that would be an ask, not for me, because I'm not the commissioner of health, I just work for him, um, but that's a fact that we haven't increased those monies in a while. On the topic of J-1 visas, we also manage that program for foreign medical graduates, for physicians. Um, each, as someone mentioned, each state, state does get 30 uh, slots to fill each year. Um, some larger states fill those by, they probably filled them by now because they got them available October 1st, and I'm sure they filled there and have waiting lists. We won't find out if there's any waiting lists of folks who want to come to our state until February when they run through their processes. So we typically fill about uh, five, six, and maybe seven of those slots each year. That's actually increased, so I appreciate the work that um, employing hospitals and federally qualified health centers and others have done to recruit, interview, and offer to um, uh, to foreign medical graduates. We can be doing more of that. Um, uh, we're working with a number of folks, including uh, UVM AHEC and Five Six Primary Cares, um, Vermont New Hampshire Recruitment Center, to promote the benefits and the process of the J-1 program uh, so that we can um, bring more folks in and fill more slots. Um, that still has to be a, a good fit for your organization and the applicant. There's still these same issues of any trailing spouse, um, not to mention distance from uh, their home country. Those home countries tend to be, uh, we've got a good mix, and I don't have the numbers on the top of my head, but I did look at them the other day. Um, we tend to get applicants from Canada, uh, from European, several European nations. Um, several of our recent um, applicants that we've been approved have been from India, some from China, uh, some from the Caribbean. So we're seeing folks from a, a wide range of regions across the, the world, um, and we, but we don't do the hiring, we don't do the offering, we don't do the recruiting. So we're trying, relying on all of you folks to. Um, broaden your search um, uh, prospects and interview candidates who may, may very well prove to be a good fit for your community. Um, and if they are a good fit, hopefully they'll stay longer than three years under the contract. Thank you, John. Yep. Very important points. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Mike Fisher, healthcare advocate. Um, I've I heard a lot of discussion about the um, regional or national marketplace for this competition. Um, but I can't, just sort of dawns on me as I hear this conversation, I wonder whether there's also an interstate competition. I wonder whether, this is a bit of an unfair question to ask a bunch of people from different healthcare providers, but it, to what degree are you all competing with each other for, uh, for the same workers? And how does that play out? Yes. <laughs> in other states, as I said, when I started. And I think, you know, one of, one of the things we, you know, fight about nurse retention, um, we made a commitment to hire more LNAs, nursing assistants, to assist on our med surge force um, to make it a better, better experience for the RS. Um, and a number of those LNAs came out of nursing homes in the marketplace. Um, but then behind the eight ball. But you know, it's it, it's part of it is the competition in house or in, in the state. For us, a little bit because our competition is also out of state. Uh, but yeah, it does happen. Mike, I can say my experience with it is um, glass half full here. It's very collegial competition, and in fact, my colleagues call me and ask me about candidates, and I tell them all about them. We we go back and forth because you really want people to be where they want to be because they're going to be the most productive in that regard. But if they want to go to New York, that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're in our network, and then we work with our oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, at that point, I think we're beyond our, our scheduled time, but I really want to thank you all for your time coming up this afternoon. And, you know, this has been a really good conversation. And I can see that um, things are starting to come together as far as what action steps need to be taken. And 
it, it's just uh, great to have this conversation with higher education and the healthcare community to try to discuss uh, some real uh, obstacles moving forward and how we can all get there together. So thank you all. It's been a really wonderful afternoon. Thank you.